So uh, with that, we are ready to start our general session. The topic this year is aquaculture, and I'm going to invite Dave Donaldson to give some opening remarks. Morning, morning, everybody. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I, I'm Dave Donaldson. I'm the executive director of the, the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, and want to welcome everyone to the uh, 74th annual uh, commission meeting, and, and welcome to the Big Easy. Uh, a number of years ago, we uh, uh, started doing general sessions, and, and we've been doing them for uh, <clears throat> quite a few years and talked about a variety of different topics, recreational fishing, uh, oysters, aquaculture, uh, oil spill science. Uh, and and, and uh, in this session, we're going we're gonna to have uh, several of our, our, our recipients of, of the uh, uh, regional pilot program projects that uh, we did for aquaculture present their results uh, and uh, looking forward to those uh, those presentations and, and appreciate y'all coming and, and, and sharing your results with us and and with that I will turn it back to Chairman Sauls to who will be facilitating this uh, session so thanks okay. our first presentation is on the advancement of Atlantic Crooker Aquaculture by Dr. Nicole Kirchhoff. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nicole. I received a $100,000 reward from this commission um, to work on Atlantic Croker Aquaculture. Oops. A little bit about who I am. I'm not a university, uh, although I have a PhD. I'm a private fish hatchery and grower we started out just growing um, warm water marine bait fish, and we've expanded over the last 10 years to also include um, some food fish species. So these are some, some of the species we grow, croaker, pinfish, and red drum currently being the bulk of what we grow, but we've also grown pompano, cereola, and we'll be growing two other species later this year for um, commercial customers. So why we chose Atlantic croaker? Atlantic croaker is part of the couple dozen species part of the live marine bait fish market supplying recreational fishing. In Florida alone, this is a massive market. It represents $274 million a year in sales. And croaker has a market as live bait as well as food fish. They are hardy and has been proven you can culture them. Texas A&M did quite a bit of work on the early stuff and they have a pretty high market value. Um, reported between $3 to $5.50 each uh, recently. they become very popular. But why have they not had any commercial development? Part of that is a question of reproductive consistency and the market wasn't really well described. So those three questions, reproductive consistency, market acceptance, and market demand are the questions that we attempted to answer in this project. The first part we worked on was reproductive consistency. For a hatchery and to be able to sell these fish for a good economic price to the market, we need to be able to produce these fish for most of the year. And the spawning season, while prolonged, is not the entire year. Early work tried to get them to spawn outside of their season. And they were able to advance it by about a month, but they were unable to get them to reproduce out of season with either a 90 or 120 day cycle. There's also questions about larval production. Previous research just took eggs that were spawned and direct stocked them into a pond. We really didn't understand what they were eating, what the survival rate was, or much of what they were doing in there, although they did survive in the pond. So we wanted to understand more of these items. So we used a 180-day photothermal cycle, and it worked really well. Um, we also tried a 180-day just photo cycle that did not work, that they need the temperature. Um, as you can see, that's a really fat, gravid female there on the left. They look very similar to red drum, just smaller. And this ability to spawn them and produce, produce larvae out of season was picked up by saltwater sportsmen and created quite a lot of buzz on the internet. So we got a lot of really good baseline data. We had nearly three dozen really big spawns that we were able to produce fish from. Um, the spawning was very inconsistent, however. We had spawns that produced between 8 and 120,000 eggs. Um, 
So you can see it's really unpredictable. The average was between five to 10,000 eggs a female though. Um, we had significantly more eggs per female the longer they were in captivity, which shows a lot of promise for further development of the species. The present fertilization of the eggs was also very variable. The average was 63%, which is pretty moderate in aquaculture, um, could be better. Of the fertilized eggs, percent hatch and survival to two days post hatch um, was surprisingly low, however, with only like 20% of the eggs that were fertilized surviving to two days post hatch, which is when their mouth opens, which kind of questions the quality of the eggs we were receiving. Um, survival of fertilized eggs to weaning, however, was pretty good between five and 57% of the ones we got through. Um, we had significantly better spawning quality when we used our slow release spawning implant compared to Overprim, which is currently on the market. To be clear, so I've been working on it for seven years to get a slow release spawning implant approved by the FDA and we're really close to getting it um, indexed right now on the market. So the next phase of this work, we're going to try to continue um, to apply for other funding and we're doing it with in-house funding to try to get this reproductive consistency even better than we've already gotten. However, we are getting eggs almost year round now. The second part of the project was about market. This part of the project got delayed quite significantly because of Hurricane Ian. Um, it was a two part project. The first part, we mimicked a project that we had completed in 2016 on pinfish using Stalton Saul Kennedy money, where we found three bait shops that didn't already sell this species of fish. We provided them with fish for a month, once a week. They were able to set the price, although we told them what we would sell the fish at to them if we were to sell them to them. They had to denote for every person who bought a fish, if they were a new or returning customer, what they sold the fish for and what else those customers bought in the shop when they were purchasing the bait fish in terms of uh, monetary value. So the results were very similar to the pinfish results. The pinfish results are the ones, if I can use this pointer, these are pinfish. The ones in red are the results we had for Kroger. On average, they sold the fish for $2.25 each, although one shop put them on the market for $4 each <clears throat> and sold out. So we think that their market price can be much higher. Every single shop we, sold, we gave these fish to sold out between one and three days. So we know they could sell a lot more fish. Um, 50 to 60% of the customers who came to buy the croaker were new customers to the shop, new foot traffic. They advertised mostly on social media, um, Instagram and such, and with banners outside their stores. 82% of the people who purchased the live bait also bought other things in the store. The average was $38.45 per customer. A lot of this was you know, beer, ice, fishing, lures, what have you. And the increase in revenue to the shops could then be extrapolated to be approximately $1,380 a week or $71,000 per year. And as you can see, this is not from buying Kroger. This is because of the foot traffic and people buying other things in those stores. So putting live bait in the stores really does increase a lot of revenue. The next part of the project was trying to determine how many bait shops potentially could sell this croaker. Um, thank you to Florida Fish and Wildlife. They gave us a very, very well organized Excel spreadsheet of every single person who has a license to be able to sell saltwater products in the state. Um, these are volunteer, these are licenses in four different categories and they're one year renewable. They all cost money. So we assume that these numbers are very accurate considering who would want to pay for a permit if they're not using it. Um, there's four different categories here, saltwater products, wholesale dealer, retail central, and retail other. From conversation on the phone with the Florida Fish and Wildlife staff member, he assumed that most of the people selling live bait had this retail central license, which is about 3,000 shops in the state. However, we didn't want to leave the other potential categories out. So this was our survey design. We did a stratified sample with 95% confidence and 5% error. Um, the variability, which means the answer to the primary question, do you sell live bait, um, we assume to be 50-50, which means 50% of them would say yes, we sell live bait, 50% no, in that retail central category that we assumed was the main one. Um, we then assumed, 
Again, no one had done these surveys before. The other categories might be a 1090 um, yes to no answer to that question. So we set the sample size to this lower variability number here. So we had a total of 753 samples we needed to collect. Um, we did these on the phone. We called each of the shops. We pretended to be customers. We had a very uh, regimented question cycle here. Do you sell bait? And depending on their answer, what kind, what species, how much are they, um, we progress to the next question. Um, I realized very quickly that me and my female voice did not do very well on this um, pretending to be a customer category, unfortunately. So two of my male employees did this on their lunch break um, or before work almost every day. Uh, it took quite a while. But it was, it was pretty fun. Um, these bait shops like to talk a lot. So some of these calls <laughs> took over 20, 30 minutes and they, they gave us a lot of information. Um, and I, it's important to say, as soon as they asked, wait a minute, why are you calling us? Are you really a customer? We told them exactly what we were doing and they usually gave us way more information than we needed. Very excited to participate. Um, so the results, we found out very quickly that Resale Central was not the only license that sold bait. These three licenses sold a significant amount of bait. Um, saltwater product license are mostly fishermen, but three out of seven of them sold live bait. Wholesale dealer, or your bait shops, and fishermen, four out of six sold live bait, and the retail central, it was three out of seven, much lower than we thought in this category. The retail other is mostly big bait stores, or big box stores, 7-Eleven, Walmart, et cetera. They basically don't sell live bait, they sell it frozen and artificial. Of these shops, shrimp was the most popular one that they sold, but every single one of them told us that's because that's what they can get, not because that's what they would like to sell. Um, when we asked them if they could sell more live bait if they had inventory, every single one like screamed yes onto the phone. Most of it is seasonal, weather dependent, <clears throat> and a lot of them said that the fish who come in from the wild, the wild supplied bait, come in extremely bad shape and a lot of them die. Um, which is untrue for the cultured bait. Um, the average sale prices is highly variable, but pretty consistently it was two to three times higher than that reported in the, in the literature currently. I don't know if you've been to a bait shop, they're cash businesses. So if you, um, if you have a survey that has an official logo on it or a university seal on it, they're probably not gonna tell you exactly what they sell things for because they don't declare it probably in their revenue line. So when you call on the phone and you ask them, they give you the truth. So the return on investment to date for this $100,000 project, we just finished it recently again because of the hurricane and delay. Um, we've already had three new farmers growing croaker. Two of them are charter fishermen, very high, high yield charter fishermen who are growing it for their own use. One is a farmer that already had grown my pinfish who are now converting over to croaker. We have five farmers currently in permitting. Aquaculture permitting is not an overnight situation. So this might take a little while, but one of them's in Texas, one's in New York. They're all, not all in Florida. And we've had already over 40 calls from bait retailers begging for Croker to sell in their shops, mostly from that Saltwater Sportsman article. Um, we haven't done a lot of art reach in part PR, but that Saltwater Sportsman article, again, got us a lot of attention. Um, I did two presentations at Aquaculture America, and we're currently working on two peer-reviewed publications. One will be on reproduction, and one will be on the um, market research. And that's it. I really thank you all for the money and support. Okay, we have time for some questions. Anyone would like to? Thank you for your presentation. I had a couple questions. Um, do you know, first off, uh, you said the price was between $225 and $4 each. Um, and there's not a market for croaker currently in the state of Florida? There is a market, but the wild supply is it's very low. inconsistent and very low. Okay. Um, do you know what the number of croaker were Per customer was approximately half a dozen. Half a dozen. Most of the shops had like a dozen deal, like a discounted price if they bought a dozen. 
I think that's just because they're used to doing that for shrimp yeah. and other things. And what what's the price? You know what the approximate price of, of a live shrimp is? No. Okay. Sorry. All right. Thank you. So from your surveys, you had a list of a lot of species that they were selling. So did y'all ask, was croaker the number one species that they wanted more of? So croaker was one of the top species they wanted more of. Um, they almost all wanted pinfish, croaker, or mullet. Those were the top species. Um, some of them wanted things like minnows or freshwater species because they kind of bridge the gap between saltwater and freshwater fishing in Florida. But we didn't really dive too deep into the freshwater part. Thanks, that was interesting. I work uh, with the, the Texas commercial fisheries landings in Texas, so. Um, one question with this, actually this is a good slide to look at. On this one, when you looked at it, did so uh, our dealers tend to have multiple licenses, and so a lot of the dealers will have, even though they don't need them, they have like three licenses that let them do the base of the same thing. Is that the case in Florida where they have overlap of the licenses when you had those total numbers? Because sometimes the same dealer would have, you know, so they wouldn't count as many as you had. So I, I thought that, but when I went through the spreadsheets, because it actually came in a spreadsheet with four tabs, one for each of the different licenses, there weren't many overlaps. I'm, that would probably be a question for Florida Fish and Wildlife, how they give out permits and how they do compliance. Right. Because I, I think they, they just chose one. I'm not really, that's what it kind of looked like. Gotcha. I mean, I, I can try to address it if you want. So if you look at those three categories there, the SPL license is your basic fishing license. The reason why you see bait sales there are because they're trying to qualify for their restricted species endorsements. And that's one of the ways to qualify is non-restricted species. You gotta catch 5,000 in sales. So that's one way they're doing it. Majority of the dealers do have the uh, resale central and the retail other. Um, so there is some crossover there. Matt. <laughs> Can, do you have an idea, how long does it take when you get, you say you're working with some new farmers, some uh, two are in, out of state, how, what does that process look like cost-wise, I mean startup costs, how long does it take for the licensing, what, do you have any idea about that or can you tell us? Well, licensing is state by state determined, so every state has their own restrictions. The biggest the biggest time commitment, I think, for most of the new farmers is finding the right piece of property. Usually it's access to water and how to discharge and get rid of that water, um, regardless of the state. After you find that piece of property and you get permission to use the water and get water, then it's about, um, then you're putting money into it, really. Um, with native bait fish species, especially in the southeast region, you don't need a ton of money on a very environmentally controlled building. These species are can tolerate some pretty big swings in temperature. Um, you just need some cover. Some of them are doing it in greenhouses. Some in Florida aren't doing it under anything. Um, some shade cloth, I think. But um, tanks and such, you can get away with you know, a pretty moderate, uh, one of these charter fishermen sells, he buys like five to 10,000 fish from me every other month. And he built like a $15,000 system. Um, this one of the biggest people who are coming on the market to sell croaker are going to be in Texas. Um, he has an 11,000 square foot building he's in the middle of outfitting. And even then, because they're a native species and they don't require a whole lot of environmental control, he can get away with, I think he estimated his equipment cost is about 150 grand. Um, the biggest thing is, is staff, how much you're going to pay your staff. And right now, feed for fish is very, very expensive. Chris? So you mentioned putting the fertilized eggs in ponds. Are you growing these out in ponds to the appropriate size, or these are in recirculating systems indoors? So the initial work was done in ponds at Texas A&M by Todd Sinks Group. I only have tanks. So we do everything in recirc and or flow through in tanks on land. So all of the fish in this project were grown um, in tanks on land with our own feed. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I do have one more question real quick. 
Did you, did you get an idea when you asked Florida how many fishermen currently catch croaker? I mean, they're going to be caught in the trawl most likely. And um, I don't know how many trawls, you know, your regulations, you know, as far as croakers, people just go out there and get croaker and that's all they get or do they get shrimp and croaker? Yeah, I mean, it's there's a couple different ways they're going to do it, but it's we don't have we don't allow trawls for bait fish. We don't have a bait fish trough, so it's either bycatch from shrimp fishery or. So, I know that the shops that sell croaker locally, I went and asked them. There's, they have fishermen that go out specifically to catch bait fish, so pinfish, croaker, mullet, what have you. Croaker, as far as I know, maybe Fish and Wildlife may have changed it, but they're not really regulated species in terms of like catch limits, um, so they can go out and catch them. But I do know that the bait fish almost coastwide in Florida have decreased significantly in numbers, so it's harder and harder to catch. There's less and less um, fishermen out there just targeting bait fish because they can't make a living just doing bait fish anymore. Um, so that's where this big market gap has come from. And most places don't sell croaker just because they can't get it. Okay. That was a great presentation. Thank you. I, that was interesting to learn about how those, <clears throat> how that bait fishery works in Florida. Um, I think we're going to, in the sake of time, go to our next presentation. The next presentation is on overcoming the challenges in the commercial U.S. marine aquaculture development of post-harvest processing for tropical seaweed species in the Gulf. By Dr. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name. How are you doing? I'm John Stieglitz okay. uh, with the University <laughs> of Miami. I'm the Director of Sustainable Seafood and Research and Development there. And so I'll be, as you mentioned in the title, looking at uh, <clears throat> how we can build capacity for integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, or IMTA, in the Gulf and U.S. Caribbean regions, uh, looking at how we can not only produce seaweed products, but looking at the end stage use in terms of post-harvest processing and value-add methods for these products. And so just to set the stage, I'm not sure your familiarity with uh, sort of the overall view of aquaculture. I know this is a Fisheries Commission meeting, so good to kind of get this out of the way in terms of looking at globally, in terms of our aquaculture production, this sort of sums it up nicely uh, in terms of looking at our overall production in terms of uh, aquaculture contributing more than 50% right, of, of seafood that people consume. Uh, <clears throat> looking at the efficiencies of it, right, in terms of farm-raised fish versus wild-caught fish, right, and also in comparison to other forms of animal protein production. So if we're looking at improved sustainability, growing human population worldwide, how can we produce more animal protein? It's going to be through aquaculture, right, and so that's the most efficient way that we can do that. And also looking at the supply chain, okay, so understanding that it's not just about production, it's also about the end stages, right? The processing, the distribution, the market, right? And so understanding that, particularly in the US, that's gonna be highly relevant in terms of understanding that in this talk today, looking at post-harvest processing methods and technologies for seaweed products. So in terms of US specifically, our seafood production, we import the majority of our seaweed, seafood that is consumed in this country. Uh, so we do see a strong need for increased domestic production. Whatever the number it is that you want to use, in terms of there's been a number of studies on this, folks for decades were saying, oh, it's over 90%. Well, now we learn that, in fact, a lot of that seafood is, is products that are caught and sent abroad for processing and then re-imported, right? And so actually the number is closer to about 60 to 80% of seafood that is consumed in the U.S. that is imported but whatever number it is you want to use specifically, the story is that we need more domestic seafood production, okay? Whether that is through wild caught fisheries or aquaculture, I believe we need both to, to fill that gap. And so we see a very strong opportunity with farm to table aquaculture production, 
right? Farms being built close to markets, okay? So in order to be competitive in the U.S., key is how can we overcome many of the low-cost imports that are coming into the country in terms of seafood products? Uh, and so we see farms being built close to markets. We see this in South Florida, where the world's largest land-based salmon farm is being constructed and is operational right now. They have product on the market through many of the public supermarkets uh, throughout the region. That's uh, Atlantic Sapphire. Uh, we also see trends. It looks like the bottom of the slide may be cut off there. But the uh, <clears throat> ideal fish up in the northeast producing the Bronzino, as well as transparency out in uh, Los Angeles, California, doing land-based shrimp production. Again, sort of exploring opportunities for these farms located close to uh, markets, right, these urban centers. And so <clears throat> within the U.S., though, you heard a little bit about it in our previous presentation in terms of permitting not being an overnight affair, right? There's a, there are challenges to getting these operations off the ground. And in many ways, a lot of these challenges are social license challenges, right? And so communities, there's, there's been a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of negative press on aquaculture over the years. So despite uh, putting out positive information and the facts, right, like we see uh, in terms of reducing use of wild fish and fish feeds, whatever the criticism may be, peer-reviewed articles, right, looking at refuting the aquaculture myths, unfounded criticisms and assumptions. Despite the facts coming out on this industry, it's still there, there's a huge amount of headwinds uh, that the industry faces in terms of social license issues. In some areas of the country, we see that changing, right, up in Maine. Uh, Maine has been very proactive, so they're uh, moving forward with a number of different operations, but there's still hurdles to be overcome. Florida, I mean, I'm biased, obviously, but I think uh, Florida is one of the best states for aquaculture in terms of the permitting process overall. So, uh, but that being said, there are still a number of challenges uh, that prospective farmers face when they're trying to set up these operations. So at the University of Miami, we focus on a number of different species, uh, anywhere from the yellowtail snapper, I'll just run you through <coughs> Cobia, the triple tail, uh, the flounder, species of macroalgae, these are just two of many of the species we work with, the cereal or voliana, as well as the American red snapper. Uh, we do sustainable seafood research and development, and the common feature of all these species is that, <clears throat> and we've worked with a number of others over the years, right, the stone crab, other species like that, where they are high market value species where the production technology may be somewhat limited, right, and so there's still some R&D work that is needed on those species, but the market is established, right? We know that there's a demand for these species if we can get over those hurdles in terms of making it economically viable for producers to grow these, these species. And so we're looking at improving sustainability of aquaculture, right, but how do we improve sustainability? Is it environmental sustainability? A lot of times people hear the word sustainable and they think, oh, they must mean environmental sustainability. Well, for farmers to be successful, they need to have it be economically viable, so economically sustainable, right? And then socially, it's got to be socially sustainable as well in terms of having communities embrace aquaculture in their community, right? If we're encouraging uh, those in working waterfront communities to engage in aquaculture, we have to show that, indeed, this is a, a viable activity uh, that is good for the community. And so we see integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, IMTA, as a great opportunity to do this, and this is the type of aquaculture where you're utilizing the feed inputs, right, that you utilize in any kind of fed aquaculture operation, right, typically for carnivorous marine finfish, and producing other products using the waste stream from uh, this feed energy that is supplied to, to the fish, right? So in this case, we're talking about seaweeds, okay? It's so taking up the nutrients from the water column. So IMTA is not a new concept. It's been around for hundreds if not thousands of years, but in terms of being commercially viable, there's still a, a hurdle that must be overcome, at least in the U.S., in terms of realizing the economic viability of this sort of activity. So there are a number of benefits of seaweed aquaculture within an IMTA context. Uh, so there's mitigation of the eutrophication of coastal waters. This is a big deal with, throughout all the Gulf states region, right, in terms of our coastal waters, looking at potential for removal of nitrogen and phosphorus from the seawater. Number of human health benefits of seaweed aquaculture through direct dietary consumption, it's very healthy, right, to eat it, even if it's, you know, regardless of the form that it's in. 
uh, utilization of unique compounds in the pharmaceutical industry. There's growing interest in that in terms of making this industry economically viable. That's very encouraging to see because, as we know, with other aspects of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, <clears throat> there can be significant, significant financial benefits to, to developing products for that industry. And then looking at reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in terrestrial agriculture, right? There have been a number of studies showing that seaweed uh, used as a, as a dry product included in cattle feeds reduces uh, methane production in cattle. So this is very exciting, right? The number of species, the main species that we hear about when folks talk about this process is the Asparagopsis, which I think we'll hear about in, in subsequent presentations today, but there are a number of other seaweed species, native seaweed species, that also have the same compounds in them that can be utilized in cattle feed to reduce or virtually eliminate methane production in ruminant animals. So a number of benefits. And huge market potential, right? So many end uses, not only human consumption that we talked about or animal feed, but also the hydrocolloids, right? So the thickeners and emulsifiers, seaweed products are utilized extensively in the dairy industry. Anything that requires to be thickened up, right, ice cream, uh, <coughs> yogurt, these sorts of things, a lot of times they're using uh, these hydrocolloids, cosmetics industry, pharmaceutical, and also in carbon sequestration, right? So looking at climate change mitigation, a number of initiatives, NOAA has put out funding announcements for looking at how uh, mass production of seaweed can help mitigate uh, climate change in terms of locking up that carbon, the, the concept of blue carbon, right, and can we lock up that atmospheric carbon and, and get it to the uh, bottom of the ocean. Other opportunities when we're talking about commercial aquaculture production, yes, if you're doing land-based production, you're <clears throat> producing potentially greenhouse gases, or right, CO2, that seaweed could help eliminate in terms of this process. And so we look at the global commercial seaweed, Seaweed market, the, the writing there is a little small, but if you can look at it uh, on your screen, you can see that the vast majority is human consumption, right? In the US, you may not think seaweed is a big deal, but in many parts of the world, particularly Southeast Asia, seaweed is a major uh, product that is produced. It is actually globally, when we look at seaweed production, it is the largest component of marine aquaculture globally in terms of tonnage. Uh, and we see strong growth potential in the U.S. market, right? This is based on market research that's been done. Strong growth potential. So how are we advancing regional IMTA development in the Gulf of Mexico and U.S. Caribbean? There are a number of challenges to this. So there are many different species of macroalgae or seaweed. Right? So which are the best ones to grow in IMTA systems in the region, right? There are a ton of them there. And so how should a farmer know which one they should incorporate into their, their production system? There's also lack of viable processing techniques and technologies for seaweed products in the region. So we're trying to figure out what are the best processing techniques and value-add procedures that will yield economic viability of seaweed mariculture operations. And also there's a need for consumer and end-user education about domestically produced seaweed products. So again, why should U.S. distributors and consumers eat seaweed products? So educating the consumer as to, okay, this is something that's good for you and potentially an alternative to some of the other forms of uh, <clears throat> protein that are out there. So initial work in this project, we look at assessing uh, IMTA biomitigation potential, so assessing the capacity of local macroalgae species to biomitigate enriched effluent from marine fin fish aquaculture. So this was a, a study that we did that was actually published in peer-reviewed journal, low offer at all. You see there the citation in terms of looking at uh, species of macroalgae Agardiella subulata, which is a native species uh, red algae, red macroalgae, and using that in combination with the effluent from a nursery production system of American red snapper juveniles. So again, it's a species that we work with, so those are F1 uh, generation American red snapper stocked at a commercial scale density, looking at how much of the waste can we remove from the effluent from commercial scale production of this uh, species. Well, the answer is we were able to eliminate virtually all of it, right, in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus from the water column. Okay, the details you can find in this paper there, but even just from a visual basis, you can see uh, the different color of the seaweed there. On the left, we see what we call our sort of fortified agardiella, where it's been grown in the nutrient-rich effluent versus uh, the control, which is just grown in our regular uh, 
Atlantic Ocean water, flow through water there, that has some background level of nutrients, but again, not to the level that we see in our fortified seaweed product there. And so very encouraging, right, in terms of counteracting, if we think back to some of those social license uh, concerns, right, one of the main criticisms that producers often face is, oh, you're going to be polluting the environment, right? Well, if you're using IMTA type technology and using seaweed to remove the nutrients, in fact, you're not, right? You're removing those nutrients and you also have a saleable product at the end uh, that can help with the bottom line. So what are some keys to expansion? in the Gulf of Mexico and U.S. Caribbean regions. Well, we want to assess promising species for culture in the regions. We want to understand the value of different macroalgae species that are suitable for IMTA type systems from the market perspective, uh, the cultural and ecosystem services perspective, as well as post-harvest techniques and technologies, right? So some species may be better or worse than others in terms of taking up certain nutrients from the environment, okay? Some may have a higher market value than others. Some may be easier to work with than others. So how do we sort of work through that quagmire of, of different seaweed species to find those that are the best candidates? Well, in the current project, we're looking at aquaculture performance of these various native tropical species, uh, four of them that you see here, the Agardiella subulata, the Calerpa racemosa, uh, Gracilaria species, as well as Ova lactuca. And we're using this in the waste stream from uh, commercial stocking density of first generation Yelltail snapper that we produced on site. So again, stocked at a density of about 25 to 30 kilos per cubic meter, which is a typical density that you may see in either a uh, net pen type operation or a uh, recirculating system for a snapper species grown commercially. Uh, we have a pilot scale IMTA system uh, where we are running this effluent through there in a flow through fashion. Again, we're not doing this in a recirculating setting because we want the results to be applicable to whether we're doing it in coastal waters or if you were doing it in a research setting, you could extrapolate based upon that. But in many cases, when you're doing recirculating systems, you're also changing the water chemistry, which we did want, not want to have as an added variable in this system. Uh, so specifically, we're looking at bioextractive capacity, the market potential. We're looking at identifying those top species, looking at post-harvest processing and value-add techniques of the various seaweed species. So of the species we have produced thus far, we've uh, sent them out for analysis. This shows a uh, breakdown of the fatty acid analysis. We're looking at the PUFAs, right? The polyunsaturated fatty acids, the omega-6, omega-3 content of each species. This is highly relevant in terms of looking at potential end uses for these products. Uh, and you can see the breakdown on those there in terms of Whatever your end goal may be, whether it's using it in other animal feeds or direct human consumption, this is the type of information you're going to want to have in terms of reporting that and seeing which ones are, are the best candidates for that particular end use. And then looking at the amino acid type and percentage of total amino acids that you see here, right? We see uh, percent of total amino acids <clears throat> and looking at them. so. Seaweeds in general are typically very rich in, in many of the essential uh, amino acids, and this is important in terms of looking at it as not only protein quantity, but the quality of the protein that we're getting. And when we talk about these fortified seaweed products, uh, this is something where we are getting that additional benefit of a, a more enriched seaweed product from this IMTA type production of the species. And we develop a stakeholder guide. This is just a segment of it, looking at whatever the parameter of interest it is that you're looking at, if it's ammonia removal, right, or phosphorus, or removing CO2, looking at which species may be the best in terms of doing that out of those that we tested, and which would be good alternative species you see here. Okay? So in many cases, we have, you know, we have a lot of stakeholder engagement. We bring people through the facility. Uh, a lot of interested parties in terms of looking at incorporating IMTA uh, in different types of production settings, and they say, well, which, one's, which one grows the fastest? Which has the highest protein content? Which does the best for dealing with CO2? Well, now we have a stakeholder guide that can help inform that process based upon uh, the results. And so if you have seafood, if we had seaweed, now what, right? We have the drying and processing techniques and technologies for seaweed. So we need to figure out what are we going to do with this end product. So this needs to be economically viable 
for U.S. producers and markets. In many places in the world where seaweed production is conducted, you see sort of artisanal methods used, like we see here on the right-hand side, sort of solar drying. The Nature Conservancy is heavily involved in, in a few different seaweed projects throughout the world. They put out this little drying guide, right? But we see a key feature here being the sun, right? Well, in some parts and certain times of the year, you may have rainy days, okay? So what do you do under those circumstances? And so developing methods and techniques that are <clears throat> economically viable that could be used in the U.S. so that farms could be successful growing these, right? Some of these methods may work from a technical viability standpoint, but they may not be economically viable here in the U.S. when we're considering U.S. labor costs and just the region that we're operating in. And then looking at these, uh, <clears throat> the shelf life of harvested seaweed. So if we're looking at direct consumption, direct human consumption, we need to look at the shelf life, just like you do in a freshly harvested uh, fish product, right, or shellfish product. So how can we improve the processing of seaweeds for fresh direct consumption? We can look at different post-harvest processing methods. This really doesn't exist. If you're a seaweed producer in the southeast U.S., you are pretty much going to be processing your own product, right? There's no place. Some, there's some operations now that Maine is sort of has an industry going on in terms of uh, seaweed production up in the northeast. They have companies that have taken on that burden of processing. But down here, you're pretty much doing it yourself. So what are the best methods to use and which ones are going to yield the longest shelf life if you are trying to get this fresh product in the hands of consumers? And if it's not a fresh product, what are the best uh, drying or freezing or freeze drying processes that can be utilized for the end use that you're going for, right? And then assessing this from a food safety standpoint, looking at aerobic plate counts, bacterial contamination, also looking at heavy metals testing, right? Seaweeds are known to absorb uh, heavy metals if they're at trace concentrations in the, in the water, which unfortunately in many of our coastal waters we do have uh, heavy metals concentrations. So looking at how we can manage that if that is found in any of the seaweed species that are cultured in IMTA. And then looking at sensory attributes, right? People, just because you tell them it's good for them doesn't mean that they're going to want to eat it. So is the color desirable? Is the odor, you know, some, if it's a noxious odor, people aren't going to want to buy that product or eat that product. Does it taste good? How easy is it to use in culinary applications? So working with those in the food service sector, right? number of chefs working with them in terms of incorporating uh, or exploring use of these products in the food service industry and also in terms of how much is used, right? If it's just for a sort of decoration in the plating process in a high-end restaurant, that may not be a big end use for a seaweed producer. Whereas if you're producing seaweed salads and it's you know on a, a greater level of production, I mean greater level of consumption, that may be a better end use. And so trying to quantify these things, using science to help us actually quantify this as opposed to it being just a subjective measure uh, to get this information out there and to assess this in the seaweed products. And so we see a number of opportunities for increased resiliency in working waterfronts. I think IMTA has great potential for integration in working waterfront communities, can help address a number of the challenges in coastal communities that we see, uh, can allow for diversification of seaweed products, of seafood products and markets, right? So instead of just being reliant on whatever your license may allow you to catch, now if you have a small MTA operation going on, in addition to that, it can help diversify your portfolio in terms of the seafood you're producing. This work would not have been possible without the hard work and dedication of UM Aquaculture Program, faculty, staff, students, and volunteers, funding from the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, NOAA, as well as our aquaculture industry and culinary industry collaborators. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any questions for the speaker? Here we go. Nice presentation, Dr. Stieglitz. Uh, that was the first thing I asked you when I saw you yesterday. Which one's the best, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and so a follow-up on that is uh, in what you've been doing there at the University of Miami, have you ever considered looking at a polyculture of uh, the different species? And if you did, you know, I know it's premature, but would you have any recommendations? Yeah, I mean, we, we're not doing the polyculture right in terms of multiple macroalgae species mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, they're 
issues you have to deal with, just like if you're growing multiple fish species together, right? They have different growth patterns, that sort of thing. It's technically viable, but from a production standpoint, would you really want to be doing that, right? In terms of if you identify the species that is the best for the particular end use market that you're going for, you may not necessarily have a desire to, to do that, right? You're gonna it may complicate the process in terms of you're adding a step. You now have to right. sort that product. Mm -hmm. Uh, you may not get the same level of growth that you would by just doing a monoculture of that particular species. I'll talk to you more about it offline because uh, I'm looking at it maybe more from the perspective of cleaning the water on a recirculating system, which we're going to talk about. Right, here right. So, yeah. so. I think if they're not, again, in a IMTA context, <clears throat> if they're different trophic levels, then yes, that works, right, in terms of adding bivalves or whatever it may be. Uh, but multiple macroalgae species, I think it's best to keep those in isolation from one another. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Dave. Not so. Th thanks for the presentation. Um, very nicely done. Uh, and I, and maybe not so much a question, but just a comment. Uh, I think probably, as you pointed out, one of the biggest issues with with algae is finding a market for it and and trying to. It, it, while it, it, it proves to be a, a good cleaner, it, it, you want to make sure you've got you can utilize it af after producing it. And have have you have you seen um, an, an increase in interest in in in, in algaes and, and what? Because it's it's kind of a hard sell, you know, that right. people don't want to eat. Mm -hmm eat right. that, but uh, have you seen an increase over the years? Of, of We have. Of, we, of, we have seen an increase. Uh, the culinary collaborators that we have on the project are, are very interested in it, right? And so that's where this post-harvest process comes into play in terms of if you are producing this product, how long is that shelf life of a refrigerated product or a frozen product, right? And so that really hasn't been quantified yet. And so if they want to use that and incorporate that in terms of their standard, you know, if they get seafood delivered once a week or twice a week to their restaurant, how would that work for a seaweed product, right? Would they need to get it every few days? Could they get one shipment a week? How would that work? So we have definitely seen a strong interest uh, from the culinary community, as well as a number of interests uh, that operate in working waterfront communities, right? Wherever you have eutrophication going on, seaweed is a great solution. I mean, we're here in Gulf States region, right? I mean, you're preaching to the choir in terms of looking at our coastal waters, right? And over, even on the east coast of, of Florida, right? You look at some of these algae blooms and stuff, and right, they're fueled by nutrients. And so if we're able to take up some of that nutrient load while also producing a product that can be sold in market, whatever that end use market may be, that's a win, right? And maybe it's a win solely for ecosystem services, but maybe it's also a win for culinary industry and aquaculture in general. Okay, it looks like we're ready for our next speaker. <laughs> Ralph Turnigan will be talking to us about um, some work he's doing in Puerto Rico. Can I stand? I talk to 110 students in a classroom, so I should, I, uh, you should be able to hear me. Um, my name is Ralph Turingen from the Florida Institute of Technology. Um, and this uh, project that was fortunately um, Funded by uh, by, by uh, you know th th this organization, the, the, the Gulf States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, it is a collaborative work with the University of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico Sea Grant, and Harbor Brent's Oceanographic Institute from FAU. So uh, one of the 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 the, the, uh, the weaknesses of a collaborative work is uh, as the PI, I have to beg for mercy from my collaborators in order to put together a progress report like this. But uh, we've been very successful, and I'm, I'm very um, um, fortunate to, to be here and presenting the, uh, 
the state of our, uh, of our project, which was funded about over a year ago, uh, but as, as I told Steve, any project that, um, that includes construction um, and uh, working with engineers is always going to be uh, a pain um, as a scientist in this case. So here we go. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is intended to be a, um, a, an intensive kind of like initiating and continuing education for engaging women in the aquaculture industry beginning with the, uh, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Um, so um, thank you, John, for uh, giving me the, uh, the, the, the rationale, adding the, the rationale about IMTA. This will be the second talk for today about IMTA. So I'll have more time to thank um, the, uh, the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission and the SNK program of NOAA. Um, this is actually a tandem. I've, I first received an, a, a NOAA grant to construct the IMTA in Puerto Rico, the first of its kind in, in the, uh, on the island. And then I, uh, I, I submitted a uh, $100,000 proposal to extend the reach of IMTA to, uh, to increase in engagement of women in, in the industry. Uh, and in terms of ROI, this is going to be 100% ROI because we're starting with zero. And hopefully by the end of the, uh, of, of the project, we'll, we'll, we'll have 50 women who is going to be engaged in, in aquaculture. And so as, as I mentioned, it is a collaborative work by these four uh, organizations, uh, Florida Tech, University of Puerto Rico, Florida Sea, um, Puerto Rico Sea Grant, and Florida Atlantic University. Um, so we begin with this global need for aquaculture. Um, as, as you can see, in, where's the point? Yeah. As you can see in this uh, recent, uh, the, the latest um, FAO, F Food and Agriculture Organization statistics, um, our consumption of seafood has dramatically increased. But the supply of seafood from the commercial industry, if you can see in here this blue line, has plateaued, uh, reached its asymptote probably about 20, 30 years ago. Um, and so if we just rely on commercial fisheries, we will not have enough seafood to uh, meet the demands of this ever-increasing um, population who are you know, uh, increasingly diet conscious, and when they see food, they, they, they eat it in this case. But look at the pink and the purple um, you know, graphs and a portion of the graph in here. This is aquaculture, both inland and, and marine. Uh, and in fact, uh, its potential for growth is tremendously high, um, and uh, it probably is, and according to the World Bank, in, in, uh, in about 10, 20 years, it probably is going to be the main source of seafood. And so um, the promotion of aquaculture globally is, 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 is a, actually a very bright endeavor, and thanks to, uh, to NOAA and thanks to, uh, to, to uh, you know, GSFMC for realizing this potential and taking advantage of such, such an opportunity for, for expansion. And so uh, women uh, traditionally has been engaged in fisheries and aquaculture, but they haven't been uh, brought up into the, the, uh, you know, the awareness of society. Uh, and although uh, over, over the years about you know, more than 50% of women uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the fisheries and aquaculture workforce has been there for, uh, for, for centuries, uh, we, we hardly notice it. So again, one of the, uh, the objectives of our work is to promote awareness. And of course, uh, that's the global picture. In Puerto Rico, it, it remains a potential. And so hopefully we can wake up this this sleeping giant uh, in, 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 in Puerto Rico that ac could actually join the workforce. Um, and, and here's another rationale for why aquaculture would be a more viable source of seafood than any of the farm produced uh, food source of protein. Um, you know, this, this is the uh, a comparative analysis. Uh, of course, I, I, I took this from from um, a compendium of, of publications of how, you know, how dangerously um, 
a, 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 a situation would be if we continue to produce hogs and beef. Uh, you can see in here that you know their, their greenhouse uh, potential in the production of greenhouse gases is actually much, much higher, several orders of magnitude. You can see cattle here versus that of aquaculture, which is almost nothing in this case. So not only that aquaculture is going to be the potential source of protein in the future, it probably is going to be the most environmentally friendly um, production uh, system as well um, in that case. Um, unfortunately, most of the aquaculture systems uh, that are being uh, practiced nowadays is monoculture. And of course, there are several disadvantages of monoculture, and that one, of course, is of, of us as biologists. We know about its, you know, the, the, uh, the impact of aquaculture, especially monoculture on selective breeding. And unfortunately, selective breeding is actually contra to sustainability because it reduces genetic variability. But IMTA, as you will see, actually mitigates this, this uh, you know, weakness of monoculture. Of course, in, in monoculture system, if there is a disease outbreak, the, the, the industry loses everything uh, because it, it, it is going to be mainly focused. And of course, um, you know, with monoculture, there is this threat of degrading the environment because you have this massive uh, waste, you know, affluence from, especially with food production, with high protein diet, you know, we'll just all, you know, go, go, go to, uh, you know, add more, um, you know, pollutants into the environment in this case. So IMTA, Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, is being promoted as a, uh, an, an alternative to monoculture. And what is IMTA in brief in here? It actually is based on a very basic ecological concept, and that is the food chain. So this is the flow of energy in the food chain. This is, uh, you know, middle school science in here is from, from from producers all the way to the ultimate consumers in that case, which would be the top predators. Um, IMTA is the inverse of this, in that you know we reverse the flow from what we actually produce, which are you know fish, fin fish. And then it goes down into having the plants as the purifier of all of the effluents from, from, from the fish culture system. And uh, you know, here's a, you know, on the right-hand side in here is just a basic flow diagram. And you know, as, 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 as Janet mentioned in here, it is not just polyculture. It actually is an intelligent polyculture because not only that you produce more aquaculture products, it has to be selective. Uh, the process of selecting those products are actually based on uh, scientific um, you know, rationale because the, the, the sequence of flow of energy in here has to be scientifically uh, set up. So fish, Effluence from fish is rich in protein, nitrogenous waste, uh, which includes all of the poop from the fish and the uneaten high protein diet, which is in fact massive. At least 50% of what goes out from, from the fish tank is uneaten food, which is very rich in nit nitrogen. And so if it disintegrates into the water, it actually pollutes the water. So that effluent is very rich in, in nitrogenous waste. And it goes into the next level, which would be selected uh, you know, organisms. These are our shellfish. We have oysters. We have clams. We can have shrimp in there. And then their affluence is still rich in nitrogenous waste because this is what, what, what we have evolved with as, as, as animals. And then it goes into the last step of, of, of the IMTA setup in here, which would be our denitrifying organisms. And these are our, our algae, our, our seagrass, and our, our mangrove in that case. So just think of this framework, uh, which is actually a very simple framework, yet um, you know, it is hardly being promoted and practiced, and thanks to this organization for actually helping us promote this. Um, here are some of the advantages of, of, of IMTA. Um, of course, uh, we, we know about bioremediation simply because it is self-sustained, it is self-cleaning, um, because any, you know, all, all, of the, all of the affluence from the last step, which would be 
algae and, and, and marine plants, it's mostly uh, going to be clean water in that case. So there's not much of an input of anything that is undesirable to, to, to the oak ecosystem. And of course, uh, you know, John again has mentioned about the socioeconomics of IMTA is a very important component. Um, you know, overproduction without realizing where the end products are going to end is also going to be uh, a create problem if we don't know where the markets are and, 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 and things to that effect. Here is our system in, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, and thanks to NOAA for, uh, for uh, you know, listening to our begging, uh, you know, voice to actually construct this because uh, we, it, 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 it is capital intensive, and so we um, have designed this um, in, in, in use and using um, locally available species. And of course, in aquaculture, we have to be very sensitive to the, 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 the prospect of introducing invasive into a local ecosystem. And so what is great about IMTA is we can identify locally available species to fit you know, the, the, the required um, integrative ecosystem that we're trying to establish in here. Um, and of course, it started off with, uh, with construction. Um, let me just see. Um, we started construction from scratch, and thanks to the University of Puerto Rico for giving us space in their marine lab in Isla Magueas. Um, and and um, it, it took us a while to, um, to construct this because of you know, category five hurricanes, and of course, supply to the island has been very unpredictable. But you know, thankfully enough, it it, it is uh, it is finished, and now we are actually in the process of addressing the main goal of of of, of our grant, and that is to train um, women into in, into the facility, and we've done that. Um, you know, but, but as as an educator, um, I know about you know. Uh, piloting or proof of concept. And so we spent several months practicing our, uh, our, our recipe in here because we have to come up with cultural manuals of not only fish, but with seaweeds and, and, and oysters and clams um, in, it, in, in, in a manner that uh, we produce these protocols and instruction manuals at the level of an uneducated mother, okay, who are our, 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 our subject matter in here. So we spent so much time fine-tuning um, our, our manuals by practicing uh, how effective they are with uh, grade schoolers, middle schoolers, teachers, you know, those that are educated, and, and, and uh, you know, using their input to actually further tone down the science so that when we finally um, engage the, the, uh, the 25 women that we selected from the entire island of Puerto Rico, uh, we know that they can easily work with us. Um, and um, an added value of, of this investment by, by NOAA and, and uh, GSMC is that not only that um, we are going to construct this and conduct a workshop, and that would be the end of an engagement. Uh, we intend to maintain this as a laboratory for continuously educating our practitioners. Uh, as they go along, they will have some questions and issues, and then we will continue to maintain this facility so that whatever issues they may have, they, they, they may come up in the future, we have a laboratory to actually you know, come, you know, invite them back and, re, and, and con continue to engage them in in training and education. Um, of course, uh, we have been working with uh, local uh, NGOs, um, and, and they're very excited to work with us because this is something um, not only new, but uh, they understand the potential of aquaculture in the island of Puerto Rico, which actually has much more water resources than land resources, uh, and which is the, another uh, rationale for us. And so um, in a couple of weeks, it's our big day, um, big Saturday, November 4th, is our big workshop. Um, um, you know, again, um, you know, training these mostly women participants, and if you can see in here, on the, you know, spread along the entire island of Puerto Rico and including the two sub-islands in there uh, because uh, we wanted uh, you know, this, this to be more representative 
of the populace in, in, in Puerto Rico. So we're very excited about that. Um, in fact, uh, if some of you would, um, you know, would, would, would be able to, uh, to, to join us on November 4th, you're more than welcome. Unfortunately, our pocket is just so depopulated that uh, you may have to pay your own way to, to, mm -hmm. to join us, but you're more than welcome. Uh, to join us in this case. So we extend this to, uh, to, to uh, you know, women to again, um, you know, um, wake up their potential of being directly engaged in, in seafood production. Um, of course, um, our, our, our action is very local, but there is this global um, um, uh, reach of, of what we're doing here, um, and it first starts off, uh, this is, you know, our, our main goal here is consistent with the national goal of, of NOAA in the next, at, at, the, at the end of this, of, of this, of this decade, uh, as well as promoting gender equality and women's empowerment in uh, fisheries and aquaculture in, 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 the, in the global perspective uh, in that case. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions for our speaker? Okay, right here. I'm turning on the mic so that everybody else can hear, but since you're right here. Okay. Um, uh, interesting presentation. I'm curious how you, um, uh, you talked about uh, actively trying to recruit women into this and using jobs as your main uh, incentivizer. Is there, was there, are there any other incentives? I mean, how do you get people to get interested in this, um, especially uh, females? Yeah, in 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 on in, a, in on on an island uh, ecosystem like Puerto Rico, they're very concerned about environmental degradation. Um, in in fact, um, you know, we had to rescue our, our our fish cages because right now there is this massive influx of sargassum. Um, you know, it just just destroys um, you know stretches of of seagrass and and, and mangrove. And so they're um, very interested in, and especially women um, in, in, in Puerto Rico, they're very interested in contributing to uh, preserving the, uh, you know, the Puerto Rican uh, you know, beaches as they, they, they used to be because ecotourism is one of their, if, if not their, their major source of, of, of economic um, uh, viability in that case. And so, um, of course, you know, there the, there is the decline in in fisheries uh, productivity that they have they have observed because these fishermen are their husbands, and so uh, you know the incentive here is, you know, they, they, they're just their desire to contribute to productivity and uh, saving and conserving the environment, uh, and and most of them are are housewives. And so again, you know, they, they see what is happening, and now they're, um, you know, they, they want to be very actively invo involved in, uh, you know, in, in doing something about it. And I think that's, to, to me, that was a very impressive uh, incentive. It's not so much perhaps about the economic uh, return, but mostly on the environmental impact you know, that, uh, you know, that they, they're realizing if they if they're, if they're not going to do anything. Um, they're going to lose their, their their tourism industry as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good presentation. Thanks. Um, so you're you're bringing women in and you're producing all these products. So on the island, was there already a demand for some of these products, or did you have to do some education or uh, social work to get them to accept, you know, the seaweeds and stuff that are growing in this multi-trophic. I, I think obviously they're already going to eat the fish and the shrimp, but did you have to do any uh, work to develop interest in those other products? Um, yes, working with with with, with our um, uh, uh, with, with our collaborators in the agricultural uh, program, and of course there is, uh, especially with seaweeds. Uh, there is not a problem with uh, markets for fish, oysters, and clams. Uh, in fact, these are already overfished because uh, you know, they, they, they're the staple. Um, but, but seaweeds, I think, uh, especially in, in, in the Western world, um, there's no problem with eating seaweeds in Asia. Uh, but, but in the Western world, it's still going to be a, 
a, a wake-up call. So there's going to be a lot of uh, you know training and and, and uh, you know processing to um, eliminate that stigma of uh, ugh, you know see lettuce. <laughs> um, I can grow lettuce in my backyard, but you know ulva is actually if if you look at ulva which is a, a, a very easy seaweed to actually integrate in IMTA. Um, if you don't tell them that it is ova or seaweed, it actually looks like lettuce. Hmm. So uh, uh, again, it, 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 it basically is to um, kind of clean up that, that, that barrier. Um, you know, that, that, that they, they, they may think that it has this very distasteful uh, taste because it is from the ocean. So a lot of educating in that part, uh, especially in algae. Um, what what I, I failed to mention here is um, there's actually a video um, that, that shows the entire operation. And you will see in there that uh, to address uh, you know, Patrick's question about multi-species in each stage, we actually have, our set system is actually set up that third level uh, the denitrifying and, and, and dephosphorizing stage actually is multi-specific. We have two species of algae. We have Gracilaria and Olva. We have seagrass and we have mangrove. Um, and uh, what we're teaching you know, these, these recipients is to actually use seagrass and mangrove for stock enhancement. So they've lost man mangrove big time because of, you know, in, in the early 80s, um, uh, all the way up to the 80s, they were actually using mangrove uh, you know, branches to build Antillean traps. So they have deforested their mangrove. And now we have the sargassum issue in the, in, in, in the Caribbean. And so replanting of mangrove is one of the visible signs of interest in this case. So the mangrove that we actually produce in the IMTA are given to these uh, women organizations and they replant in them in, 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 in their backyards, which are mostly going to be mangrove forests in that case. So it really is cool. I hope that uh, you know, maybe uh, your next meeting will be in Puerto Rico so that, <laughs> so, so, so that uh, you, know, you, 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 you can see this in action and in fact even feel, even feel the need of this. And, and Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands is, are actually the great potential to, in, to, to demonstrate how, how far-reaching uh, our programs here in, in, in the continental U.S., um, you know, those two tropical commonwealths um, are our are, are demo, a backyard, to, you know, promote this on a global basis. So we'll cover it. We know we'll have the Northeast, we have, uh, you know, the, the, the sub-temperate in Florida, and we have the tropical in, in Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. So I'm lobbying for, for, for more support. Thank you. <laughs>
we succeed in, um, in, in developing and further expanding this IMTA in the island of Puerto Rico, um, the, you know, the economic incentive, they can actually uh, sell these to the big hotels um, and uh, replace locally produced uh, seafood, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, use this locally produced seafood to, uh, to replace imported, which will probably uh, bring down cost uh, as well in that case. So um, since there is none of this in Puerto Rico at, the, at this moment, um, you know, I think before I retire, the, ex I, the, the expansion potential is, is, is very high still in that case. Um, and, and forming these organizations, these NGOs, which are they're pretty good in, in doing so because of their uh, you know, social nature. They like to work as, 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 as a group and all that. Um, so uh, I, I, I do believe that expansion is at this point in time not a problem. Yeah, yeah thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we, we do need to move on to our next uh, presenter, but I do, I wanted to encourage anyone in the audience, if you have questions for any of the speakers, feel free to step up to the mic during the Q&A and, and ask your questions too. So our next speaker is Patrick Rice. He's gonna be talking to us about black grouper uh, aquaculture with oysters. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dr. Patrick Rice. I'm the Chief Science and Research Officer and the director of the Southernmost Marine Aquaculture Research and Training Center, the SMART Center at the College of the Florida Keys. And I'm here today to talk to you about some of our continued work on trying to develop innovative hatchery technology for the black grouper, and more recently, uh, in, uh, applying some integrated multi-trophic aquaculture using oysters and seaweed. So first, the question, why black grouper, right? Um, well, the main reason is that fisheries data over the past few decades has shown a precipitous decline in the populations, uh, as much as 94% since 1990. And this has led to uh, closures in 2016 in the South Atlantic for the black grouper. Uh, these closures are from January 1st until April 31st, which has had a tremendous economic impact on the Florida Keys, especially with regard to fishers, uh, restaurants, and just tourism in general. Uh, basically every restaurant down there has grouper on the menu, uh, so they're having to import a lot during these closures. And so this um, uh, basically makes you think of, uh, it makes it critically important to start considering aquaculture for this species, but there are no hatcheries anywhere, as far as I know, in the United States for any of the grouper species. Um, and that's probably because grouper have a very complex uh, 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 sexual reproductive strategy, they mature first as females, and then the, the alpha female will transition to a male uh, at about 90 centimeters, so they're very large. And uh, because they're so big, these are the targets for the recreational and the commercial fisheries. So that means that they're being removed at, uh, at a higher rate, which is really problematic when you start to think about the population structure of, of black grouper. In the Florida Keys, there can be as many as 60 females to one male. So removal of one male from that spawning population can have tremendous impacts on the spawning potential for that season until the next female can transition uh, to a male. And this got us to thinking, um, what if we meet the fishers at the dock and when they land the fish and after they've filleted the large, black, the large males, perhaps we can get in there and grab the gonads out of the carcass before they throw it away and cryopreserve them uh, and create a, a, a gene bank or a source of male gametes uh, for aquaculture. So in our first grant from the, uh, um, this commission, uh, we did, it was called Guts to Glory was the name of the grant. And we were, we were really excited about the potential for it. However, what we noticed was, oh, excuse me, I'm going the wrong way. What we noticed was uh, outside of the, uh, during the open season, the fishing season, out of, out of the more than 30 fish that we sampled, none of them were running ripe. None of the males had any sperm left in them. So they had spent everything during the spawning season, which is good for the closure, right? It means the closure could be very effective in, in helping these uh, populations rebound. But it made us stop to, to rethink our strategy a little bit. And what we decided to do uh, moving forward, uh, this next spawning season, we're going to actually go out and try and collect milk from uh, the, the large males 
uh, during catch and release fishing, bring the fish onto the boat. Hopefully, the, uh, the expansion of the swim bladder will cause them to do what's called something called running ripe, where the sperm just comes out of the fish. And if that's the case, we can collect it right there uh, and crop preserve it. If, and if they're not running ripe, well, we have some techniques that I'm going to talk about in a moment that will show you how we're going to try and extract them manually. Um, and again, the ultimate goal for this particular part of the project is to create a sperm bank for, for uh, black grouper. Um, and for our fish that we're bringing into captivity, the systems that we've developed, uh, we focus only on the females, primarily because the females are much smaller, easier to capture. They live in shallower water, so they don't experience barrel trauma when you bring them up. We can, we can catch them uh, on scuba with nets rather than hook in line, and so you avoid all the issues that are associated with something called uh, hook shyness. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, a fish that's captured on a hook may go... Uh, we've had a couple as long as 21 days without eating because they don't want to eat because of the trauma associated with the capture on the hook and line. And, but because we only have females in these tanks, we've had to come up with some strategies to try and induce egg maturation in the females uh, without the presence of a male and that behavioral uh, uh, conditioning. So before I get into that, though, let's talk a little bit more about how we're going to try and maybe extract that sperm on the boat uh, uh, this coming spawning season. Um, if they're not running ripe, uh, this picture shows how you can take a cannula and you can slide it up through the urogenital pore into the male gonad and using a little, little negative pressure uh, that you can apply. I, I have a, a variety of different mechanisms for doing this. You see a syringe here, but we also have a, 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 have a modified uh, grease pump that you use for your car. Um, I won't go into the details on that, but uh, uh, we'll get it if it's there. And um, then we take that sperm and uh, by the way, let me go back here. This is one, one grouper that, uh, the only grouper that we found that had any sperm outside of the, uh, or, or during the open season, but it wasn't enough to try and crop preserve, just a smidge you can see in this, this picture B here at the, at the top. Um, so what we do is we take the sperm and we mix it with, or the milt, and we mix it with a commercially available product called uh, Fish Freeze from Sindel. And basically this is a crop protected, which uh, helps uh, the sperm, when you thaw it out, it increases the motility and the viability of the sperm. Uh, so uh, we flash freeze it with liquid nitrogen and put it in long-term storage in our minus 86 degree freezer. For our systems that we've constructed at the college for the females, we basically have, I'm going to hopefully get this right, there it is. We have three tanks that we've uh, constructed that are roughly 1,000 gallons each. Uh, and these tanks are, let me see if I can do this, uh, connected, uh, all the water flows into a sump which we have circled in red here. And uh, pay attention to the sump because this is where we're going to do some of our IMTA stuff that we talked about uh, in previous uh, um, presentations. All the water from that sump uh, goes, uh, oh, excuse me, let me back up. This sump is where we do our water conditioning as well. We have our protein skimmers connected to it, our heaters and chiller pumps are connected to it, biofilters, and all of that water is then pumped uh, through the... Um, uh, through a UV sterilizer before it's returned back to the tanks. Each of these tanks is equipped with a specialized uh, lighting system from a company called Once uh, that uh, mimics uh, photo period. We can mimic sunrise, peak sun, and sunset. And we can even mimic the lunar cycle with these lights. And, and these fish are lunar spawners, and so uh, that's uh, um, uh, where we are right now with it. We have had some real issues, though. Um, the social hierarchy in these tanks is just amazing. I've never experienced anything like this with any other species that I've worked with. And uh, you can see here on the far right, tank three, um, we have one fish there that's very aggressive, and she's killed the two other fish in that tank. So she's now in solitary confinement by herself, uh, and we're not letting her play with anybody else. But in the other two tanks, we're, we've had a, a really uh, interesting dynamics and uh, and who who gets to eat first and who doesn't get to eat and uh, which one. Uh, we think we may have some immatures that are transitioning to alpha females, uh, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. An, in, an innovative strategy that we've tried to employ to try and uh, induce egg maturation in these females um, uh, we uh, is to incorporate... Uh, spawning uh, acoustic um, recordings of spawning behavior uh, for the black grouper. We were lucky enough to uh, get some recordings from Dr. Michelle Scher Scherer at the University of Puerto Rico. And here you can see in the upper right-hand corner uh, a, a spectrogram and, uh, excuse me, an oscilloscope and a spectrogram which shows the male group recording uh, 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 noises or acoustics. It basically starts off with six to eight uh, short barks, we call them, 
And then what I like to call the wah-wah uh, time is this uh, wah 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 that the, the, the male makes. And we, we take that and we amplify it uh, and we transmit it into the take, tank through a tactile transducer, a subwoofer called a bass shaker. You've probably heard this at any given time. Uh, uh, some people thumping down the roads. Uh, it's the same type of technology, nothing fancy. Um, but it's been very challenging because um, uh, the noises in the, in the tank, uh, the water, the aeration, uh, the pumps outside have all really impacted what the fish are hearing in the tank. So we have a, a, a hydrophone connected to um, a portable interf audio interface which allows us to hear what the fish are hearing and then try and tweak it to try and get it to where it's just right. But it's been incredibly challenging. Uh, so our next step is to, uh, we're going to focus on maybe shutting the whole system down, shutting everything down, the aeration and everything, uh, when we're on the full moon cycle and just making it really quiet and then playing the recordings and seeing maybe if that has an impact on our fish. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, these tanks have no windows, so you, you can't look at them, you can't observe them uh, with any windows, and that's primarily they're really shy and skittish. And so that's not only to uh, make them feel more comfortable, but also to not disturb them with people coming. We do tours. This is a showcase at our college, uh, and a lot of people come in and look at it. So each of the tanks is equipped with... Uh, underwater infrared cameras which transmit the uh, uh, images to a laptop computer and we can have a lab monitor so at any given time you can just switch to whichever tank you want to to see what's happening in that tank at the time and the ultimate goal would be to uh, broadcast this on a website uh, on the internet to try and employ citizen science and crowdsourcing and students to help us monitor the fish behavior. I'm going to have an interactive website there where you can uh, record or check a box if you see a specific type of spawning behavior, maybe hydration or something like that. Uh, and then hopefully that will go to our cell phone and tell us, hey, you got to get to the lab pretty quick because the fish are about to give you some eggs. So here's a beautiful recording of our... Uh, one of our stars, this is P1. P is because her tag is pink, and one is because she's in tank one. And for reference, in the background here, uh, these tubes are 14 inches in diameter, so you can get an idea of how big she is. So hopefully she'll be giving us some eggs pretty soon. Here's our system completed, and uh, we, we put egg collection systems on this, thinking that maybe you know we might get... Uh, some eggs, but in retrospect, looking at it, we don't anticipate that these females are going to uh, broadcast any eggs out of their own volition without a male being around. Um, and if they did, it probably wouldn't be of any benefit to us because the sperm is in, frozen in a freezer, so we probably couldn't get to those eggs before they hardened and, and got some, we could get some sperm on them. So um, we're changing our strategy a little bit, but we do have the egg collectors because if we're lucky later on some point down the road, if one of these females happens to transition to a male at about 90 centimeters, then maybe we will get some uh, voluntary spawning in the tanks, but um, uh, we'll see about that. So this is a pioneering, some pioneering work. Nobody's ever tried to domesticate this species before, so everything we learn on every day is, is, is something new. And um, what I wanted to kind of focus on, at least one of the deliverables, is growth behavior in captivity for this particular species. So if you look at this growth curve that was produced by CEDAR, uh, it's a length to weight relationship. Our girls are right here between 50 centimeters and 70 centimeters in length. And you can see uh, uh, on the graph on the right here, R3 has, has exhibited the fastest growth rate. Probably to be expected, she's alone in the tank now and eating on her own and there's no competition for food. But one of the fish that we actually removed from her tank, O3, uh, which you see over here, she was getting beat up by R3, so we put her into uh, uh, tank 2, and she's growing uh, really quite well, as, uh, uh, growing quite fast as well. And uh, all the data suggests that our fish will start to show sexual maturity at about 70 uh, centimeters. So we're anticipating soon that we'll start to see some eggs when we sedate them and we cannulate them and we look and, and we do the observations, what we call biometrics at the lab. Um, and they're, you know, the average growth rate is about 16.16 uh, millimeters per day. So that's roughly six to eight centimeters per year, uh, which is not really fast, but at least they're growing really good. And we're feeding them. We're making these crazy sausages uh, with shrimp and fish and uh, Mad Mac, which is a maturation diet. And uh, they seem to like it. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's a lot of work. but. Um, and then if once we get to the point where we see the eggs, and we know that the eggs are getting to that tertiary stage and ready for maybe hydration, uh, we're going to try and push them over the edge by using some uh, GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, 
Um, for our application, uh, we initially thought we would use the implantable one. There's been a lot of talks about it. You've heard some previous people mention the, the GNRH implants as being very effective. But if you think about it, we don't have any males in the tank, right? So if we get the females releasing eggs without males in the tank, it could be problematic. So we're thinking maybe to look back at uh, something like either Ovaprim or Coriolan, an injectable hormone that can give us results in a 24 to 48 hour period so we can be ready to go with the sperm, collect the eggs, and, and we're gonna actually sedate the fish um, and try and strip spawn them into a bucket and then use the sperm and do in vitro uh, fertilization. And, and just at that point, we're gonna see um, you know, what's the egg quality and what are our fertilization rates? And that'll be some of the things hopefully we can uh, uh, deliver towards the end of this grant. So moving on, uh, this is about to, supposed to be a little bit about IMTA, right? So one of the things we noticed and one of the reasons I applied for this is because these fish are big, they eat a lot, they make a lot of waste, and we're having to spend a lot of labor on water quality monitoring and water changes, up to 1,000 gallons a week uh, for our water changes. And so, um, I, you know, knowing that macroalgae can be a very effective uh, um, mechanism for producing nutrients from uh, a wastewater, and especially in a recirculating aquaculture system, we decided to look at Asparagopsis taxiformis, which you've heard Dr. Siglitz talk about a little bit here. It has a lot of potential. We chose it for a variety of reasons. One, it's been reported in the Florida Keys, in the waters of the Florida Keys. Uh, two, it does have this potential to practically eliminate methane production during cattle farming. Uh, and so we, we partnered with an organic cattle farmer just outside of Miami, and he's very interested in getting this product from us. So, you know, you've heard about finding the end, the end user, and so we've got the end user for this. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can uh, complete that cycle. But I tell you what, Asparagopsis taxiformis has been really hard to find in the waters down there, surprisingly. Um, we found this website called the Microalgal Herbarium Consortium, and down here on the right-hand corner, you can see they have a little thing called an interactive map. And this is amazing. When you click on it, it gives you a map like uh, of a global distribution of Asparagopsis taxiformis. You can zoom right into the Florida Keys, and each of these blue dots indicates a place where the algae has been collected, and not just seen, but actually collected. However, a lot of these collections are from the 60s and 70s, so they're really old. So what we've been doing is systematically looking at uh, uh, working our way up the keys at, at sites that have multiple uh, reportings. Unfortunately, we haven't found it yet. I was so excited this last weekend. I was right with my kid on a bike ride, and I thought I saw it at the end of this bridge, and me and him were down there picking through it. But uh, when I sent, uh, when I consulted a local expert, he said, no, no, it's not. You're, guess again. Um, but uh, with that, uh, one of the local es experts, Brian LaPointe, Dr. Brian LaPointe, has indicated that um, uh, along Big Pine Key and the Seven Mile Bridge in the Florida Keys, are uh, he actually has seen some at Newfound Harbor just this summer, big patch of it. So we're gonna, it's, it's seasonal, which is something else that I learned. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, it has two life cycle stages. It's got a diploid phase and a haploid gametophyte phase. And uh, the gametophyte, it gives you this traditional structure that looks like pink Christmas trees underwater. Um, but if you're in the wrong season, you're not gonna see it. So uh, we're hopeful that we're gonna start finding it soon. But Dr. LaPointe did something interesting. He pointed me to Dr. Michael Wine uh, at uh, the University of Michigan. And Dr. Wine is a legend in the seaweed uh, uh, um, industry. And he's actually the one who wrote the book that I had when I was an undergraduate at the University of Texas, um, Introduction to the Algae. So I called him and I had a great conversation with him over an hour long. And he's agreed to help me uh, confirm the identification. Once we find it, we'll send him the species. Really nice guy. He's 83 and still working. Uh, uh, what an inspiration. But in the meantime, we've reverted back to some of the more um, um, traditional subjects. Ulva, which you've heard talk. Ulva is a, is a great uh, uh, biofilter, by the way. And Ketomorpha. And I'll talk more about how we're actually integrating this into our system in a moment. Uh, but moving on to the bivalve part of this, right? Um, uh, these... Uh, the waste from these black grouper is, is uh, large and particulate, and we thought maybe bivalves like Crassostria virginica, which is a, a great filter feeder. I did my first uh, ever paper on this particular species. Um, and we found a good source for it, uh, the Great Florida Shellfish Company, which gave us 1,000 spat uh, in July. And uh, we counted them, we weighed them, and we put them in a quarantine tank before we wanted to put them in our system, right? Um, and completely unexpected. We were feeding them with nanochloropsis and isochrysis, which I'm learning now is not the best things to feed uh, shellfish. Um, but when we did, we were having tremendous swings in pH. Uh, we would start with pH uh, at the beginning of the day of 8.2, and 24 hours later it would be 7.4. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. 
But um, since then, we started to use a, a product called Rotogrove, uh, which is an instant algae from Reed Mariculture. And since we started using the Rotogrove, the systems have stabilized. The oysters are growing really well. So we're going to look at uh, some of their other products at Reed Mariculture. Um, they have a shellfish product that's specifically for oysters. We're going to we're going to try and see. And once we get a little bit more information, a little bit more comfortable, we're actually going to put these guys in the system. Uh, we had an opportunity just to play with some Florida-based scallops just to see what they would do. And uh, they're great filter feeders, but uh, we learned the hard way. All 25 of them that we got died within a, a very short period of time because they have a one-year lifespan. So they're probably not the best candidate for trying to, to do some integrated multitrophic aquaculture, at least in our system. Um, and here's uh, just a, a summary of our, our IMTA system that's incorporated with our grouper system. Here you can see the red lines indicate uh, the flow. Here's that sump I was telling you about. So we have a sump pump in here that's continuously pumping water up and over the door and into our raceway system here. Here's where we intend to put the oysters for now. Uh, ultimately, though, they're going to live in the sump so that they can get the particulate matter from the, uh, directly from the tanks um, uh, during siphoning and other things. And then downstream, we've got, we're going to hopefully have a sparagopsis here. Uh, but right now, this is where we have our ulva and our ketomorpha. And this whole thing is controlled by a float, uh, another excuse me, another sump pump with a float switch, and that just pumps water right back into the, into the sump. Uh, so that's our IMTA system at our, at our college, and hopefully the next time I report on this, I'll have a little bit more data for you on uh, the changes in water quality, especially uh, the reduction in labor, because it's a, uh, we got, you know, that's a great segue to the next slide, uh, because it's been a, a lot of work for our research assistant, and our, I've gotten the STEM coordinators and volunteers, and, and even our STEM ambassadors involved with it. Everybody loves it. It's fun. They like playing in the lab over there. Uh, but it's just been a lot of work. And with that, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Thank you. That was uh, that's a lot. I, I learned a lot during that. That's interesting stuff. Do we have any questions for the speaker? <laughs> yeah, this is just a quick question. The, you said there's a hierarchy in the in, in, in the tanks. What do you attribute that to? Is it Say size? That again. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part. The the hierarchy in the in the tanks is that attributed to size, or or what do you what do you know about that? Wow, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I've never seen a species like this in my life. Um, we had a big, uh, big black grouper uh, who was roughly 32 inches, uh, and uh, the little 24-inch uh, R3 killed her. I don't know how. I don't know why. I mean, I know how, but I don't. It, it, just the dynamics. And, and um, what I'm noticing is there. It's it's almost like a personal trait, a characteristic in the fish. Some of them are aggressive. Some of them are not. We've got a P1, who's our star. She's in a tank with two other small immatures, probably, and she lets them eat first before she goes and eats. But she's definitely, uh, you know, when she wants to eat, she comes and eats, but there's no, you don't hear any fighting in the tanks. But in tank three, where we, um, we had O3, which is the one I told you exhibited a pretty good growth. She was in, in the, the three stands for they were in tank three uh, when we tagged them. O3 was in the tank with R3. We, we had to remove her, and when we put her in tank two, she was one of the smallest ones. She's grown the fastest. She's eaten the most. She's dominating the other two fish in there, and they, I feel sorry for them. Their poor little lives are spent hiding in these pipes that we put in there for them because they're just terrified to come out. Um, but luckily, because they are in the pipes, we put the pipes right next to where we feed them, and so we can actually feed them. Um, but, yeah, just the, the social hierarchy for the, the – uh, I think, you know, maybe the way to get to some of those answers would be to look at um, hormone levels and see, are we, you know, seeing fish that are, are they meant to, to be an alpha from, from the get-go, or are the, is it a, is it a um, like, we do a lot of work with clownfish, and it's the behavior of the clownfish and the alpha that, that suppresses hormone production in the other fish, so is that what's happening, you know? Uh, we really don't know the answers, but that's one of the coolest things about working with this particular species because nobody knows the answers, and everything we do every day is, is giving us new information. Thanks, Patrick. That was really interesting. Um, I'm curious. I may have missed this. You may have talked about it, but why or have you not been able to get males for the the tanks. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, 
The males are big. We don't have a lot of space at the college. We're at the Florida Keys. Uh, we just recently uh, took over some property in Big Pine Key, 14 acres, where we're looking to really expand this project and, and use uh, outdoor systems, bigger tanks, maybe some natural photo period might help a little bit as well. Um, but one of the biggest problems with uh, getting the big males, for one, uh, there's a lot fewer of them out there. Um, number two, they live deeper, much deeper, like past 100 feet. So... Um, you have real big problems down there trying to collect them, especially on hook and line, because before you can get the big ones to the boat, a lot of times they get depredated on by sharks. Um, so then you got to switch your fishing tackle, right? You get really heavy fishing line, and the idea is when you get one hooked, crank it to the surface, right? But then you have all of the compounding issues of barrel trauma, you know, from the expansion of the swim bladder, bulging eyes. You have to immediately vent. It's just really invasive, the whole pro process. And then you got to have a, a boat with a big enough tank on it to house a, a big, you know, uh, one meter long fish. Um, so these are just some of the reasons we decided to focus on the females. But knowing that, you know, I doubt any funding agency is going to let you project, you know, we're going to catch these little fish and we're going to wait five years for them to transition to a male. You know, you're probably not going to get funded for that. So we, we started trying to think of some innovative strategies. And, and if you think about it, if we can, if, if this is successful, not only are we creating a gene bank for the species, right? But at the same time, we might be able to insert other species here, right? You know, uh, crop preserve the sperm and get the females uh, and, uh, and, and, and use this in vitro fertilization as, as a strategy for, for hatchery uh, uh, methodologies. Okay. Yeah, I, that's, that's good to hear. I have one thought on that. I know in Mississippi they've had some success in hatcheries with working with programs like CCA to go out and collect, I'm sure, anglers with given like the the importance of that species and fisheries and how sensitive it is, they may be willing to work with you guys to, while they're out fishing, donate a male if they happen to catch one to the hatchery. I know there's some problems you just mentioned with like depth and things, but if they were to encounter one, I think that would probably be a good we're option to consider. We're spreading the word like crazy down there. Everybody knows me as the gonad guy down there. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I do radio sh uh, a monthly radio show. And I, I encourage the fishermen to contact me. In the first grant, we had a lot of money set aside for rewards. But again, uh, they can't catch them and keep them during the, spawn, during the spawning season when they're, when they're, when they're gravid. So um, uh, we are going to work with some uh, uh, legendary fishermen down there in the Florida Keys uh, uh, this coming spawning season. And uh, um, hopefully I'll do, I don't know if I'll do a workshop, but I would like to maybe try and at least educate a few of the guys and buy some small uh, liquid nitrogen doers and teach them how to do it and provide them with uh, pre-mixes of the fish freeze so that if they get one that happens to be running ripe even though they're fishing for snapper or something else they you know they often catch these fish and if they come up running ripe they could just collect the sperm for me and, and flash freeze it but um, yeah we're just we're making progress every day and uh, um, anybody who wants to help come on down to the keys we'll, we'll love to put you to work especially uh, changing some water Any other questions? Audience? Members? Our next speaker is Portia Sapp, and she's going to talk to us about public perceptions of offshore aquaculture. Very uh, timely topic. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about stakeholder perceptions of offshore aquaculture. In Florida, we're very diverse, but we're always looking to expand. And we had recently done a project with NOAA and Coos a marine spatial planning project identifying possible areas for offshore aquaculture in state waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and we identified a lot of acreage that may be suitable, but one of the main um, issues moving forward is just public perception of offshore aquaculture and making sure that the public is educated so that they, they can make a good decision about um, how they feel about offshore aquaculture. So the, the project was funded uh, through the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, and again, we worked with NCOOS. We also worked with University of Florida IFAS. They have a PI Center, which is public issues education. So they did a lot of the stakeholder engagement just so there wouldn't be this um, issue with bias or with us being in the room while they're doing stakeholder engagement. So a quick overview of the project and methods, and then I'm going to go into the perception toolkit that was developed and then next steps for the project moving forward. 
So for the project, we wanted to connect with relevant stakeholders, focusing on coastal communities and also working waterfronts in Florida. Um, the Pi Center facilitated listening sessions and interviews between January of 22 and April of 23. And then lastly, based on the feedback that we heard during those sessions, um, the Pi Center working with us developed a toolkit that we can then share with stakeholders and Sea Grant and extension agents so that we're all communicating the same way with the public so that we make sure we're educating the public. Because one of the things that we learned um, working with Sea Grant as well is that we're all using different terms. Some people say mariculture, some people say marine aquaculture, some people say offshore aquaculture. So we want to make sure that we're not adding to the confusion that the public has and that we're all speaking the same language as well. So for the listening sessions, um, we had four focus groups and we did focus the virtual or the in-person meetings in Pensacola because those were some of the areas that we identified in our marine spatial planning project that had the most promise for offshore aquaculture in the future. So we really wanted to focus on those areas. Um, we did also hold two virtual listening sessions. And as I mentioned, the Pi Center held those. Um, they did have pre-approved questions that we worked on with them to get some really targeted feedback from the stakeholders. But again, we were not present um, and we didn't participate in the virtual sessions either just so there wasn't this bias or any other, um, I don't know, just a perception of bias from the stakeholders. So some of the categories that we covered in the discussion were general seafood consumption, familiarity with aquaculture and offshore aquaculture, um, and then also areas of concern. And it's kind of hard to see, but there are some questions there on the side. So those are the, the main questions that they asked the participants. Um, and I really like how the Pi Center did this too. We were not looking for people that knew a lot about aquaculture or that were experts or that were necessarily pro-aquaculture. We really wanted to target people that um, had concerns or um, you know, had, had voiced that they really didn't know a lot about aquaculture and were interested in learning so that we could really get to some of the issues with public perception. And here are just a few of the participant responses when they were asked how they would define aquaculture or offshore aquaculture. Um, and you can see there's a gamut, a very wide array of responses. Um, and just from those talking about artificial reefs um, or some of the other comments, you can see that we had a bunch of people that really knew nothing about general aquaculture. And then getting into some of the concerns and mis misconceptions, a lot of the same things that we hear across the U.S. Um, in areas where aquaculture is, is trying to get started. Um, so you can see you know, concerns about impacts to fishermen, concerns about impacts to water quality, um, concerns to public health. And just a couple things that I found interesting from, from the listening sessions. So 35% of the participants said that they do eat aquaculture and farm seafood from the U.S. 30% said they eat um, wild products from the U.S. only. So I thought that was kind of interesting, um, especially since we're in Pensacola, um, just those responses. And when we drilled down to some of the reasons that they made these choices, 54% um, said they wanted to support their local economy which I think is great. So these are things that we can really start to emphasize, you know, in our toolkit, but also emphasizing that, yes, wild-caught fisheries are local and we should, we should be supporting local fishermen, but aquaculture can also be local and we should be supporting those um, industries as well. Um, what I thought was really interesting when we started to ask them about the benefits of offshore aquaculture, 35% said they saw no benefit of offshore aquaculture. And 18% were very candid and said they don't know enough to say if they think there's a benefit or what those may be. So that definitely gives us a lot of room for improvement with education and outreach to at least the stakeholders that we engaged. So now I'm going to move a little bit into um, the toolkit that we developed. And uh, we wanted to really attack with the toolkit from as many different platforms as possible because from the stakeholders, I was really surprised a very small percentage said they would get more information from social media. I think maybe we just had 
possibly a skew toward, towards older individuals um, in, in our stakeholder group. Um, so we decided we were going to attack from every possible, possible avenue, developing social media content, also an informational video, presentation slides, and then also a, a printout or handout flyer. Um, and we held a, a, a webinar in June of this year and invited Sea Grant and Extension agents so that we could share all of these items in the toolkit with those Extension agents so that we're all speaking the same language and then also answer any questions that the Sea Grant agents may have about how we, we developed these and went through the, the process. Um, and these are just a few of the materials. So these are some of the slides. Um, and we really wanted to focus on offshore aquaculture in Florida would be native marine species, not transgenics or non-native species. Um, there were a lot of concerns brought up, you know, specific to escapement. Um, and then also talking about the benefits of offshore aquaculture to Florida. Um, and these are a few more, um, you know, just talking about how we can expand domestic seafood production and also increase our food security. That's really emerged, you know, post-COVID as a critical theme um, and something that we're really focusing on in Florida. You know, we, we produce a lot of tropical fish, but to get into the realm of food fish production and really trying to produce um, more so that we can have increased food security is, is essential. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the impact on local economies and fishing communities, and then navigation and access for, for fishermen. Um, and these are a lot of the things that we used in our marine spatial planning project as well. I don't know the number of layers that we used in that project, but it was hundreds of layers to really refine specific areas where we can minimize <coughs> conflict with existing users. But then we also had parameters from the aquaculture industry identifying what water depth they would need, what flow rate, um, distance to shore, distance to processors. So we tried to add in all of the, um, the things that industry needed and then exclude areas that would be conflicting with existing users. So we're trying to attack this from as many different angles as possible. So uh, just moving into uh, next steps. So even in Florida, where we've got over 1,000 aquaculture facilities, we still have a, a very uh, low awareness of aquaculture and what it is. I remember when I was an inspector, people would stop us all the time because they'd see our logo on our trucks, and they'd want to know what aquaculture was because they just didn't understand it. So um, I think we have a lot of work to do, and we'd really like to use um, social media, so harness the power of social media and the reach that it can have. Um, we're also looking into doing some more marketing campaigns with local farmers so that we can share that story that you're buying a local product and you're supporting people in your community. Um, and then the other component that we're doing is youth education. So we do a lot of outreach and education, uh, K through 12 education. Um, we put aquaculture systems in schools and help teachers get started so that as people are coming up into society that we have a more educated public. So if, if we can get kids when they're in middle school and high school, not only do they take that information home, but then they're also more educated on aquaculture. And also you're training people then that can go into these other systems, you know, and, and work because they have an understanding of aquaculture. So those are kind of the different um, ways that we're trying to address the concerns and misconceptions. Um, I do have a QR code on the bottom that will take you to the, uh, the toolkit, and you can watch the video, and then there's also those slides there in the one pager if anybody's interested in looking at those. Um, but we're just working to figure out our next steps as far as how we market this to the general public and then how we engage the public when we start looking at some of those marine spatial areas that we've identified. I'll take any questions. Any questions? John. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, watching it, there were just a lot of questions going through my head. Um, so, a percentage of people you indicated, indicated they, they were already consuming farm products. 
how many of those people were, were aware were they consuming a domestic or an imported product and do you have any sense that they're going to have any favor for a domestic product over an imported product? It, it looks like what you're going to produce here isn't going to be directly competing with imported products. So. Um, yeah, the, the individuals that we asked specifically said, you know, they prefer wild caught seafood or farm seafood from the U.S., that they trusted that product. Um, there were individuals that said they would only eat wild U.S., so they had several categories that they could fall into. Um, there were individuals that don't eat seafood at all or that would eat wild caught from anywhere or anything. You know, they're just not educated about what they're purchasing at all. Um, so it was, it was spread. But I thought it was interesting that there were, you know, there's this contingent that was, we want U.S. product. You know, we want wild caught or U.S. farmed product. That's what we're looking for. So I think there is that opportunity. Um, and now we're, yeah, the, the offshore aquaculture, we're not necessarily looking to, to compete or offset. I think it's more to have that food security and to have another option. I just had a follow-up to a great presentation. Did you get any sense from the survey data that people indicated that while they wanted a domestic seafood product, that they'd be willing to pay more for that? We, di we did not drill down into that specifically, um, but I think the fact that people were prioritizing locally sourced products, I think that kind of tells, you know, that they're willing to pay more if they're specifically hunting for that product. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. First, I applaud your effort. Um, you know, whenever I, I teach introduction to aquaculture at the college or anytime I go and I start talking about aquaculture, everybody, is, this, concept, this perception of aquaculture is bad. It's, it's just pervasive. It, it, and, it, and it's been 20 years now, you know, um, so I applaud your efforts on that. Um, I noticed you mentioned something about offshore, or your slide at least said offshore aquaculture, and it, it mentioned that the cages were submerged, or the, is there... Is that a, a, a mandatory requisite, or, or can you have floating sea cages? Or um, well, I don't know that there's a prohibition necessarily on floating. I think the um, the possibility to submerge is probably necessary in Florida waters because of our storms. Okay. Um, so I think most of the stuff that we've been looking at, or that has been proposed in state waters, is submersible. You know, it, it's probably at the surface most of the time but it's submersible when there's storm. When there's a storm, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks, Portia. Um, it, looking at the, the stat you had, or the, the interest at least in the educational component of like looking at high schools and educating young people, do you know, are there any programs in Florida in high schools or junior highs that oh, yeah. aquaculture? culture? Okay. Oh yeah, there's a lot. Um, so you already have in. Yes, we've done system. we've done multiple years now. Um, we've we've worked with schools. We certify them so that then they have inspectors coming in. The teachers love it because then when it's the day for the inspector to come in, that's the class. You know, we go in and teach the class and talk to the students. Um, but also in the last two years, we've gotten grants from USDA to actually give classroom systems to schools. So we have an open application process, and we just did this in July or August, I believe, um, and we gave away 10 more systems. So the teachers come to University of Florida Tropical Aquaculture Lab. They get a day of presentations to learn about aquaculture. They learn about water quality. They get hands-on experience doing that. And then the next day, the schools that are getting the systems actually stay and build their system. So they learn how to put everything together. Um, and then they can either take their system back or we'll come and deliver it and help them set it up. Um, so we've been partnering with University of Florida on that project for a while, but there's a bunch of schools that do that. Um, we'd like to see more expansion potentially into marine species. Um, Cedar Key has a fantastic program. Um, and it, they, they do, Leslie can speak more to it, I'm sure, but they have a salt program. And they do not just, um, aquaculture, but they do boating safety and forklift operation and first aid and CPR, all these other things that are good life skills, but that also, 
you know, help you be a good fish farmer or fisherman, these skills that you may need for those those activities too. So there's a lot of really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just uh, make a comment, not, not necessarily a question. Uh, I thought, I noted that the second speaker had mentioned that Florida is very friendly to aquaculture, and now I see why he made that statement. It's very, I'm, I'm just very interested to learn about all of the types of outreach and the way you're, the ways that you're trying to support this. And I know that the younger generation is very. Uh, um, interested in food production and, and, and quality food production. And so it's, it's really interesting to learn about all this. I really appreciate all of these presentations so, so far. So thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I have one from the audience. Excellent. You said, um, <laughs> I know you mentioned so much about offshore aquaculture, but I just heard, um, that some has been proposed in state waters. Could you tell us about that? So the state of Florida only has authority to issue aquaculture leases in state waters. Um, and currently there's two projects that are proposed in federal waters off of Florida, two offshore projects. Um, there's nothing currently proposed in state waters. Um, and that's kind of the, the first step of the marine spatial planning was to identify some areas that would minimize conflict and maximize the attributes that industry would need, but there's no current applications in state waters. Okay, if there's no further questions, we'll move on to the next speaker. So our next talk is, where are we at? Uh, Dr. Oh, Leslie's next. Okay. You guys are sitting in a different order. <laughs> so Leslie Starner is going to talk about uh, some work in, also in Florida in the Cedar Key area. Thank you. This was a picture given in a presentation by Bill Walton, for, formerly with Auburn University, at an Oyster South Symposium in 2020. Now, since um, the fouling control of cultured oysters targeted for the half-shell trade represents a major um, effort and expense of off-bottom oyster aquaculture, there was tremendous interest by oyster growers. Setting of fouling organisms, barnacles, natural occurring oyster spat, sea squirts can occur almost year-round in the Gulf of Mexico. So the use of urchins as a novel biofouling control method certainly could potentially reduce labor costs and increase farm profitability. The one-year pilot project funded by the commission addressed the question, can urchins be raised in culture with oysters? There is interest in culturing the green sea urchin, Lytoconus variegatus, which is native to the Gulf of Mexico for its very valuable row. But would co-culture have any significant negative or positive effects on oyster production? Briefly, the experimental design included um, wild-collected adults stocked at three densities with 40 sub-adult urchins. They were stocked into floating cages at two commercial farms on Florida's west coast and overwintered and harvested after five months. The pilot study results were that urchins had no effect on the oyster survival or growth, but it did reduce biofouling oysters as the amount of time to clean the oysters decreased with increasing density. Ur uh, urchins also reduced the biofouling on the bags at one of the farm sites. So to move this proof of concept forward, the next steps were to reevaluate the co-culture of eastern oysters with urchins using hatchery-produced juveniles at commercial densities of oysters over an entire production cycle. Objectives for this study, 18-month study, was to document hatchery production of green sea urchin juveniles, determine the performance of oysters with and without urchins, 
and that's through the field nursery, intermediate grow out, and final grow out stages to evaluate the current commercial farm sites uh, on Florida, Gulf of Mexico coast. Uh, we included those two farms that were in the pilot study, Alligator Harbor, which is a high salinity site, Oyster Bay, which is a variable salinity site, and included uh, Skipper Bay and Cedar Key, which has more of a medium salinity um, characteristics. And lastly, to assess the biofouling on oysters and bags with and without urchins. A closed system hatchery located at the University of Alabama in Birmingham was to produce the juveniles for this project. We were going to target like a seven or nine millimeter test diameter. We did collect the adult broodstock from uh, St. Joseph Bay in the panhandle of Florida, and that water body has an overabundance of this particular species. In fact, resource agencies conduct uh, roundups to try and control, control the populations. But there were difficulties in producing the juveniles with, due to a variety of problems. Thus, for this study, we still had to rely on wild collected um, urchins. So we went back to St. Joe Bay to collect, uh, in this case, we had sub-adult ur urchins, about a tw 29 millimeter test diameter. That was the smallest size we could collect in the numbers to stock our field trials. <laughs> We used triploid oysters of R6 seed size. That's the size that's typically purchased and planted by growers. Uh, we stocked these in new four millimeter bags and floating uh, bags with the floats attached to the sides. This was done over the summer. The experimental design consisted of 1,200 urchins and, and, excuse me, 1,200 oysters and 12 urchins, then 1,200 oysters and no urchins, and then third, uh, just bags with the urchins themselves. Now you can see the picture in the lower right. We were concerned and did a preliminary test um, that these larger urchins might actually consume the, the uh, oysters themselves, but um, they did not. And rather they enjoyed placing those um, oysters on top of themselves, um, which is a unique characteristic to urchins for um, protection. So at the Cedar Key site, it's located in open waters and um, very uh, a lot of prevailing uh, weather conditions. And we did document winds or uh, gusts of over 30 miles per hour during the field nursery stage. And after about 20 days, we did see urgent survival of uh, we had no survival left. Um, that amount of turbulence is just too much for that fragile test size. For most of the nursery um, trial at Oyster Bay, the salinities were 20 PSU or less, as opposed to, to Alligator Harbor, which is rather steady at about 30 PSU. And then at the Cedar Key site, we see salinities that vary in this case from 31 to, to 21 PSU. And then after um, uh, just 22 days, again, we had no survival of the urchins. The picture there shows stressed urchins with missing or drooping spines. We did a site inspection at Alligator Harbor at roughly the same time frame. At that point in time, we had 100% survival of the urchins um, in the first treatment and then about 68 in the third treatment. We did harvest um, the nursery stage after uh, two and a half months. At that point in time, uh, we saw survival reduced to 36% in the first treatment and no remaining uh, live urchins in the third treatment. Um, we did observe blue crabs in some of the bags, and that certainly probably resulted in predation of the urchins. There was no difference in uh, oyster growth or survival over that period. Um, so we continued with the intermediate grow out stage, and we did that at the three sites, but conditions at um, Oyster Bay and Cedar Key were still not favorable for urchins, so I'm only going to report uh, results from Alligator Harbor. Again, we had to go back and, and collect sub-adults from um, uh, St. Joe Bay to use in the, this particular stage. Uh, uh, our triploid oysters were nursed at Alligator Harbor, and they were stocked at 400 per bag. Now we put them in new 9-millimeter mesh bags, again with cylindrical floats. The experimental design consisted of varying the urchin density from 10, 15, to 20 per bag, as well as the placement of the floats from um, the, the top to versus the side, as you can see in the picture in the upper right. 
uh, for the control where there were no urchins. The growers were, a the growers were asked to flip the bags um, for biofouling control on a biweekly basis. We did add another treatment, and that is we brought in the nursed uh, oysters from the Cedar Key site where there was a large um, barnacle set on the shells. Um, and that was because, really, there was minimum fouling on the uh, oysters that had been nursed at uh, Alligator Harbor. So after 3.5 months, we harvested these to assess uh, growth and survival of the urchins and oysters, as well as to transfer to the next growing stage. We saw um, no significant differences in growth or survival of the um, urchins, but the urchins in treatment E were certainly larger, both in, in test diameter and weight, and the highest survival, 98% after that time frame, followed by um, treatment A at 87%, and then we dropped down to 53% survival in treatment D. And those differences in survival are really related to the float placement. So the floats placed on top allowed the bag and thus the urchins to sit deeper in the water column, and that's the results you're seeing there for treatments E and A. Um, because the differences in at stock of the oyster sizes, we did just analyze growth rates, but you are looking at the shell height of the oysters by treatment um, at harvest. But there were no differences in growth, whether it was shell height or length or, or uh, the weights um, of the metrics that we measured. There was significant difference in survival. That was just due to the very low variation in the replicate bags. Nonetheless, the survival was very high, ranging from just less than 100 to, to 99 percent. Uh, but, but overall, there was really no influence um, on production of oysters due to the presence or absence of um, the oyster, or, excuse me, urchins. To assess biofouling, we did count the number of barnacles, the dominant fouling organisms, on a subsample of oysters um, prior to stock and then at harvest. We saw a 64 percent reduction in the uh, number of barnacles. Uh, in treatment E, um, the biggest difference observed was that in the uh, oysters in the control, it was a large accumulation of um, a matrix of uh, two building amphipods along with accumulated sediments and de uh, detritus and debris, um, whereas all of the oysters in the various treatments with urchins were basically their shells were clean. Um, it was hard to quantify this because it would slough off or uh, be dislodged when handling and most likely would be cleaned during uh, tumbling or post-harvest uh, activities. But there was a large number of amphipods, enough that would certainly provide as a, would be an irritant for the oysters and possibly um, interfere with the feeding process. To determine the weight of the biofouling on the bags, we removed the floats from the bags and weighed them about four hours after harvest and then subtracted the pre-deployment weights of the bags. We saw significantly higher weights um, in those bags where the floats were placed on the top as it allowed for accumulation of um, macroalgae, bryozoans, and other organisms. Interestingly enough, we um, did not see any differences in the biofouling weights uh, with the floats on the side, regardless of whether there were urchins or not in the bags, and that was the lowest amount of biofouling weight um, observed. So even though oysters had reached or exceeded market size um, at Alligator Harbor in just about six months overall, we decided to continue and do the final grow out stage as that reduced the oysters down to 150, milli 150 per bag, and we stocked in 14 millimeter bags. Um, we added adult urchins that were wild collected to this study here and compared with the sub-adult urchins. So the experimental design was varying um, the numbers of and the sizes of the urchins used, as well as, again, varying the placement of the floats on the bags. Um, somewhat similar results, we did have, uh, although we did have higher growth rates and survival and weights with the, um, excuse me, the juvenile urchins or the sub-adult urchins used versus the adult uh, urchins and certainly survival, survival, excuse me, John, you are right in the way of my 
<laughs> looking at my data here, excuse me. And we certainly, um, as we saw in the, the other trial, I had um, the highest survival of the urchins in those bags where the floats were placed on top. No differences in the oyster growth rates at all. I just wanted to say that um, the survival and the growth was just exceptional at this particular site, probably some of the highest growth rates that um, is documented in the Gulf of Mexico literature for, for oysters. Similarities in the, as in the previous intermediate trial um, for uh, biofouling, we did see a slight increase in barnacles on the oysters um, in the control where there were no urchins stocked. Um, we did see a decrease, 59% of the urchins again in treatment A, excuse me, E. Uh, similar results in terms of bag fouling whites where the floats on top had the highest fouling weight and then the fouling with the um, Floats on the side didn't vary as to whether there were urchins or not um, uh, stocked in the bags. Interestingly, the fouling on the bags was lowest with the adult uh, urchins versus the sub-adult urchins. Again, um, the urchins kept the shells of the oysters free of any accumulated sediments and uh, some soft-bodied um, uh, organisms such as sea squirts compared to the um, oysters in the control. So we con continued to engage our oyster growers in Wakulla County where Oyster Bay is located as they had tremendous interest in this project. They experience a lot of fouling on their um, oysters, particularly in the summer compared to what you just saw in terms of fouling at the Alligator Harbor site. So we did a couple other uh, field trials over the winter period where salinities tend to be higher. So it's a brief period. So the question was, could urchins act as polisher of oysters two to three months prior to harvest? And we worked with a grower in Skipper Bay as he used floating cages. And we also wanted to look at that gear type as opposed to floating bags. Um, so he sourced um, oysters from his crops those that were heavily fouled, and then another cohort where the fouling was minimal or nominal, actually. And then we used wild collected adult urchin stocked at uh, 20 per bag as um, the test. The control, uh, excuse me, the control had no urchins, and the grower then flipped uh, the cages and did a 24 hour uh, desiccation uh, bi weekly. Um, uh, so again, in terms of, um, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, John. So we saw no mortality for the adult urchins that were placed inside the bags, and, and that's similar to the results of the pilot study. Uh, similar growth rates and survival for the, the oysters in, in both treatments there, um, we, but we did not see any growth in the urchins um, over that time frame. These were harvested after about two and a half months. So a similar decrease um, in treatment A, whether it was the test or control bags in terms of uh, the number of barnacles, and a slight increase in treatment B, and again, both the control and test bags of the number of barnacles. Um, so basically, it was sort of a wash. Um, and again, uh, as we saw previously, the, the urchins do keep the surface of the oyster shells clean, um, but uh, well, Culler County does not um, uh, actually experience the type of heavy um, amphipod infestation as experienced in uh, Alligator Harbor. So to summarize, reliable hatchery production of urchins is going to be necessary um, to even move this forward to commercial development. And use of urchins as um, biofouling control method would certainly be limited to lease areas where they have high steady salinities and certainly site conditions um, might restrict also the use of urchins. You need to be in areas where there's a little bit more protection from prevailing conditions and gear type might be more favorable to use the floating cages versus the floating bags, although most of our growers tend to use um, the floating bags as their gear type. So co-culturing of organisms require conditions to be favorable for both growth and survival of, of the species involved. The results of these field trials were not necessarily favorable for ur urchin production. 
nor was the potential for biofouling control of oysters clearly demonstrated. So other practicalities of stocking urchins in oyster culture bags weren't addressed, such as tumbling, which is a, um, which is a method that's used routinely by uh, growers to size grade and sort out their um, oysters prior to harvest. So these findings really limit the potential of commercial development of urchin and uh, oyster culture on Florida's Gulf Coast. I'd like to recognize um, our participating oyster growers, um, UF staff involved, as well as funding from the Gulf States Marine Fishery Commission. Questions? Thank you. Do we have any questions? Let's see, a member of the audience. Thank you. Leslie, good presentation. Appreciate you being here and making it. Um, just kind of, just from a broader standpoint, I was just curious your thoughts after going through this and looking at urchins, and I know you're aware of what's been done with other critters to put in the bag to see if they can help with the biofouling. What's, what's your feeling? What's, what's the next direction given the limited, um, I, I, I'm, this is my characterization of what I heard you say, limited success here. What, what's the, what, what is the more favorable, I mean, do you want to try this again or some, some similar critter or you want to, would you look at crabs or snails or you know, puppy drum. I mean, what are we what are we looking at next here for biofouling? Well, I agree. Um, there's been a lot of consideration to have somebody other than the human manage the biofouling control. What can you put in the bag? And obviously, urchins have been tested in other states as well. Different urchin species. There's a lot of interest in that um, because of their uh, grazing capacity. Um, but uh, again, anytime you involve co-culture, you have to weigh the uh, limitations when you're involving another species. And since the obviously the money maker is the oysters, um, we've tried to assess what other species might be more favorable. That um, the, the urchins, are, as I said, there's limitations in terms of salinity regimes, and it has to be a species where you can reliably produce it in a hatchery environment. So um, I don't know what the next steps are, but certainly um, hopefully in another couple of years you'll hear from that at another commission meeting. Sorry, I don't have a good answer for you right now today. Any further questions? Okay, well we're running right on time, I think. Um, for our last speaker, so we have plenty of time before lunch to get through our last talk. And don't please don't feel rushed. <laughs> our next speaker is John Valentine, and talking about work in Alabama at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm filling in a bit for a collection of real aquaculture scientists who are a part of this study team that are here, particularly Kelly Lucas. But Stephen wanted me to come and provide some introductory information on a project that we're just getting off the ground in the north central Gulf of Mexico. We have a diverse array of talent that's involved in this team. There's Kelly Lucas, who I know a lot of you know, who, who really made her name in aquaculture, but Kelly's moved on to become a vice president for research at Southern Miss. And so we're going to struggle at times to get her to be involved with later aspects of this project. Her substitutes, Reggie Blaylock, who's out at the Thad Cochran Center, Steve Sampier from Sea Grant, who we've embraced to help us get the outreach piece of this project off the ground, Michael Chambers, who I know some of you know, um, involved with IMTA and the Aquafort design. Um, it's fascinating to me, as I'm an ecologist by training and a food web guy, to see how aquacultures embrace food web theory in a whole lot of ways that are out here. And so I've been fascinated by that. And of course, NCOS, who's leading the charge on the permitting effort, and, and Ken Riley at, at um, NCOS again. So for the presentation, I just mentioned the team members. I want to show you what the process is. 
I want to show you what our farm requirements will be, site selection, which we're working intensely on right now, site and community preparation. We've already conducted a number of meetings with the community. We're trying to allay fears about aquaculture that exists out there, predominantly with the NGOs, but also the wild-caught fishermen are nervous that they're going to be put out of business, and we're telling them that's never going to be a feasible alternative. I want you to see a little bit about the aquafort. It's a little bit different than the other IMTAs that we've heard about, and then our operational overview. So we talked about that already. Um, Ralph did a great job of explaining why we're here, and that is that the fishing pressure from marine and inland waters plateaued around 1990, and yet the need for seafood protein continued to grow almost exponentially since that time. So I won't go into all the details of what that was because Ralph did a great job covering that and will save time so that Bev can get to her luncheon. <laughs> but you know, something that has stuck with me in this 30 years I've been in the profession is the, the territorial nature of lobbyists in Washington. And what I always heard at the National, uh, the National Marine Lab meetings in Washington, Sea Grant meetings and all the rest of it is, is that aquaculture was not a viable choice in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And the reason was partly because we're an industrial sea, as Steve Morosky describes us, but also because we have hurricanes. But it's fascinating me that somehow they think there's less hurricanes in the southeastern United States or the storms that blow up off of the Pacific Northwest and so on. So Kelly convinced me that there was another alternative, and this grows off of the oyster aquaculture industry where you could get a commercially available product in as little as a year. And whereas my daughter's neighborhood up in the Chesapeake, it's a three-year effort. It turns out we can put redfish in the water in October after the peak of the hurricane season, and they will be a commercially available product by the following June or July. Something really got missed here, and it created this opportunity for us to write the IMTA proposal that we submitted to Steve and the RFP to sh call attention to this demonstration idea that, in fact, there could be opportunity for commercial harvest of fi fin fishes in, in the Gulf. So the plans we've had to go through along the way were to establish the farm parameters, the siting analysis, you'll see this is an incredibly detailed process with NOAA. We've had first public engagements. We've had pre-permit agency discussions. And this is a challenge right now because in this post-COVID world we're in, the feds don't have as many employees as they once did. And getting on their calendar has been a real challenge for us. Hydrographic surveys of the selected sites and backup sites, a lot of comparing and contrasting. Lots of structural modeling that's had to go into this, environmental sampling, permit applications, that's another public engagement that's coming up, and then deploying the aquaford itself. So right now, in the process that I outlined for you a minute ago, we're about halfway through the siting process. We've had the analyses that were done sometime in the summer. We had a pre-engagement meeting, which I'll show you in just a few minutes. Um, Mostly, the public is not expressing reservations on this project, but the NGOs are keeping their powder dry. And, and we know that we've got some work to do with them. We have pre-permit discussions already with some of the agencies, the surveys for the hydrological work. We're just finished this summer, and the structural modeling is ongoing as we speak. So we're about halfway through the process. We'd like to be moving faster because we wanted to get in the water this year, but we won't. So who's showing up to these listening sessions? Well, Sea Grant hosted the first one for us. LaDon Swan and his group pulled us together. Steve Sempier honched it. And we hosted it at the uh, Department of Conservation's Five Rivers um, Studios on Spanish Fort. Pretty cool facility if you haven't been there. We invited over 400 people. We targeted fishers, shrimps, Shrimpers, oyster people, and we were, I didn't know there was a term for that, but that's what they called it. Oil and gas, state and local and federal people. We only got 55 to turn out to the meeting. 60% of the people turned out in person. 
Another 40% came on virtually, and we had a whole host of presentations and, oyster, and um, posters, and we talked about design with them. We talked about the aquifort with them. And we talked about what we had to go through. We formed a panel and answered the public's questions in this meeting. Um, and on the bar on the right, on the, the graph on the right, on the left panel, or right panel, excuse me, you see the distribution of participants that were in there. Overwhelmingly, government employees showed up to this meeting. We had some NGOs, we had some college scientists, um, business and industry, but it gives you an idea of the distribution and the diversity of audience that showed up for this meeting. So right now we are set to locate the aqua fort in coastal Alabama. Site three is where the preferred site is. There's some issues that have been raised about hypoxia in the northern Gulf, and it's, some of it's related to COVID. A lot of it's still driven by deep water horizon and releases of freshwater inflow that came as the state of Louisiana attempted to control the penetration of the oil into their wetlands and their tidal creeks. And what we're looking at is what's right off of what's called Fort Morgan. And, and part of the reason we went with this area is one, proximity to a boat launch, because there's going to have to be regular feeding that goes with the aquifer. Part two is for the aquifer to be successful, we have to anchor it in sand. And we have to anchor it in 30 feet or more of water. And from the middle of Mobile Bay to the left on, on this panel, it's all mud. It's very, very shallow stands of sand that are out there. So it has to go to the east. We can't go a whole lot further to the east because it's tourism industry. And people don't want to see this sort of thing out of their, out of the, off their beaches. So we've got an area that we've targeted. But you can look. We had to look at the bathymetry. We, there's, believe it or not, there's military limitations that are over in that area. When I was a graduate student um, working in that area off the west of Dauphin Island, I actually had a cruise missile fly over top and then take a hard right turn and head towards Eglin Air Base. So there's a lot of military activity that goes on out there. They looked for unexploded ordnance, but thankfully we didn't find any. We had, we had to look at shipping lanes. We had to look at vessel traffic, sh shrimp vessel activity. You, you see the whole list of categories that we looked at, and NCOS did an incredibly detailed assessment of the sites and users and what conflicts that might have come up from placing this in any one of these site locations. So it's a very, very detailed permit process. We had archaeological assessments done, and this just shows you the blip from one of them. Um, there's still a lot of Civil War relics that are out there. The battleship Tecumseh is in that area. Believe it or not, the last big naval battle of the Civil War was fought in that area. Um, the two forts were there. Um, and for those of you who are biodiversity buffs, E.O. Wilson's granddad fought in that war. So there's a lot of story and history that goes with this. But you can see, just gives you an idea of how much detail goes into the placement. So we're looking at multiple um, different trophic levels, just like you've heard many times now in today's meeting. The goal being that you'll have a higher order consumer, which will be the product that you'll use to sell. But you'll also have filter feeders. In this case, it'll be oysters. And then at Grassalaria. Now, I have some reservations based on what I've heard today, because I come from the plant animal world. And if your stuff is palatable, we're not going to have a lot of algae that's going to make it because of the mesograzers. So we're going to have to take a look at this as we put this project in the line. So essentially what I'm reading from everything I heard today is we're creating food web modules out there in these IMTAs that we're creating. So opportunities to mimic nature in all kinds of ways also exist in terms of basic research. The aquafort, um, Kelly was all about this. It's a demonstration of a novel sea -grow seafood growing system. It's being used extensively throughout the Northeast. And Michael Chambers has got an outstanding effort that's going on up in the Rhode Island area. We have a very strong outreach program at Dauphin Island. We have K-12 program that reaches about 10,000 kids a year. We have outreach programs. 
We are partnered with Biola Batteries High School, Alma Bryant, that has a professional academy that's doing aquaculture and learning how to grow oysters already, and so they've agreed to come on board. And then we'll be also be using my newly renovated aquarium on, on Dolphin Island. So, and we're getting about 120,000 people a year going through there. So in addition to that, I'm using my Rotary Club membership to talk to everybody throughout the state about this as one aspect of what we're doing. And like I say, people are interested, but they're nervous about, about it. So this is what the aquafort looks like. I saw a lot of recirculating IMTA stories today, and I understand why that's the case, but this will be an open water aquafort. And this will be installed off of the um, Fort Morgan area that we missed. We've got, we're waiting on the ADC data to come back because we have to work on the mooring system to make sure we can get this well anchored in the, in the sand that's out there. Um, Michael Chambers will be working on that as soon as he gets his data. You can see it's a raft. Effectively, it has two bays. So opportunities to do manipulations like we're hearing from the other guys with the IMTAs today also exist. So opportunities of all sorts, from basic research to delivery of actual farm products, is something that I think is, is worth looking at in this project. And you can see, in this case, it's Michael's. He's growing steelhead trout. He's growing blue mussels and algae up in the northeast. And we're not going to have blue mussels, you know, thankfully. We're not going to have perna, I hope. Um, you know, I'm good with steelheads, but nah, that's not going to work. So we're, 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 we're going for red drum here. You can't kill those things. So, but we did look at a host of different species out there. In addition to the red drum, we looked at the spotted sea trout, but they're kind of sensitive and, and a little touchy to deal with. So we looked at triple tail, and that's a high demand question in, in Mobile right now because they're there's a sense that triple tail may be overfished, although I saw it last week for sale in downtown Fairhope. So there, it's, it's around, but we've settled on that. This tells you a little bit about the parameters that are going to go around where we've settled. Again, we need close proximity to a boat launch, but we also need close proximity to where there's going to be farm participants, and that's really lower Mobile County, I think is where this is going to be the case. Because the rest of to the east is all tourism. And, and you kind of don't want to mess with those mares and their tourism. So um, again, we have to have deeper water. That's a challenge uh, to get with the other requirements. We're trying to have good current flow. So and not just food coming from what's been placed out there by the farmers every day. You're also getting an alochthonous input of prey that are coming through the web. Every day as the tides are changing and, and spawning's going on and, and lots of other things that are just native to these things. Wave height we haven't settled on yet. And so that gives you a little bit of background. Again, we're setting up for the pre-permit agency discussions and we're looking at 40 people. Here is the list of organizations that we're going to be talking to. We can't just talk to the federal government, though. We've also got to talk to state government. These, these folks, um, boss Chris Blankenship is helping us navigate this challenge right now, but we're also talking with Conservation's Legal Council already, and they've made some adjustments to their language so that we can actually do this project in Alabama. So they've been very, very positive about it. We even have a letter from Governor Kay Ivey supporting this. So we've done a lot of the legwork um, there. We've had ongoing monthly meetings with NOAA and their NEPA personnel. Steve's been guiding us through this process. And he's been excellent at this, and there's a lot of art to this, I think. So we're moving forward with that. Um, and believe it or not, I've come to the end of this one, so you'll get to luncheon time. So thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. We are good on time. We have time for plenty of questions. So shoot away. There we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, that, that aquifer looks really interesting. Um, I was curious. You said uh, it needed to be uh, placed in a, uh, an area where sand was a substrate. Right. Uh, 
why can't you use mud or why can't you place it in a place where there's it has mud? to do with the way Mike anchors these things. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, it has to do with the way Mike anchors the aquifer. Mm. Okay. And he's, you know, we don't want this thing washing up on the beach, so I'm not going to really call him out and say, you know, we, we shouldn't do it. We should do it off of Dolphin Island. Um, there has been an issue out there with low dissolved oxygen in places, particularly in that July, August time frame, um, which we're not planning on being doing anything, but we're learning that hypoxia is not limited to Louisiana. And right now, I would say we should be more impressed by what we don't know about the spatial distribution of these low oxygen cells than what we do know. And we can't afford to have this fail. We need to, we need to have this work so that we give it an adequate try to see that it's viable. There will be economic analyses that go with this. They'll, you know, but we're pretty excited about the outreach part for the kids. You know, and as, as everybody in here should know, if we don't get to the, to the children before they finish middle school, we've kind of lost them already. And so we want to we want to push that piece real hard in, in our efforts. I'm not completely sure I answered your question, but I'm trusting in Mike. All right. Good. <laughs>but we got to get to the point where we can have the pre-agency conversation. Yeah, folks in the audience, Chris, we all know you, but just make sure you state your name and yeah. affiliation for you. Uh, Chris Nelson, uh, Bon Secours Fisheries. Dr. Valentine, thanks for being here and appreciate your presentation. Um, I, it, Got to follow up on that E.O. Wilson comment. Not really, but I was I was fascinated by that. Um, in, you you mentioned you're going around and talking to Rotary right. clubs, so this is a little off topic, but not really. Um, what's what's your sense of people's other than just general ignorance of what aquaculture is and isn't, and particularly offshore aquaculture? What's your feeling for the top three? pushbacks that you get from the average person, not your, I'm, I'm trying to be careful how I characterize this, <laughs> your, your usual NGO type pushback that's been politicized, but somebody that just is, you know, kind of doesn't know all what they've heard, but that that's an important well, source of information, for, or an important data point for me to know kind of what people's you know, general pushback is. the one thing that stands out is folks who are not normally conservation oriented talk a lot about invasive species, but we're harvesting through Thad Cochran's. They're, these are being fertilized. These are Gulf of Mexico stock, you know, so we address that one. The commercial fishermen are always nervous and they're always concerned that they're going to be put out of business, so to speak. Um, but, you know, if you just sit down and reason with them, and I'm not afraid to sit down and talk to them, as you know, um, you usually can get them to come around. You know, in this, I mean, the best example I have for this, Chris, is you know when we had the oil spill. I mean, it, that 24 news hour cycle was killing us. But once we got the fishermen involved, and they were doing all the patrols and identifying the plumes and all the rest of that. I think that that worked, and I thought that that helped a lot. And I think, you know, right now, you know, Doug Ankerson, he, he's all about this right now, and all of his staff are all about this. So we're engaging with the fishermen. I want, I want them to be the ones who take part in this farming effort. 
because then we're, we've got buy-in from them. You know, I've talked to, to Barnes over in BioLabatchery. He's okay, you know. And then it's more interesting is, in your case, did the, the what's the name of that convention center at Gulf Shores that you guys have? So I, I did a presentation for, the, for basically all the tourists that came down for the winter. And I would say lack of understanding. I mean, everybody was from Wisconsin and Minnesota, and we walked them through that, this piece of it. In terms of biodiversity is, is how I put that particular spot. There's a lot of not knowing. So getting our aquarium geared up with the right outreach is an issue. I want to sit down with Ladon and see what we can do about reaching out to his network. You know, SOS Bio Battery has already been involved in this. Um, the guy from Mississippi, I can't think of his name at the moment, has been involved in it. So we've, we've been reaching out to these guys. But as you know, it's going to be about trust. And that's really the trick. We're going to have to be open and transparent throughout this entire process. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question completely, Chris. Thank you for the presentation. Um, a quick question about the depth requirements. Do you have, is there anything that's really driving that minimum eight I, meter I don't or know. It's, it's something to do with the hydrodynamics of the aquifer. Okay. That, that's all I know. And that's where the modeling's coming in. We're still waiting to get the data from the acoustic Doppler to get to him so that we can do this. But he was adamant it had to be 30 feet. Okay, thank you. It could be that the, the wave train, you know, it could be that that disrupts that mooring system too much. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so I think, I, I don't know if I missed it, but you mentioned red drum. Is that the species that when, when this gets to going, is that the species yes. you're going to grow? Um, and then you mentioned talking to the fishermen. So. The state of Mississippi is the only state that allows commercial harvest of red drum, and we have a tack of 60,000 pounds, so it's a very small market. Have you talked to the fishermen in, in Mississippi about this, specifically the no, red drum? No, but fishermen? I assume Kelly has. Um, that, that may be yeah. something that needs to be addressed. Well, yeah, we, we'll have to look at that. But, we, you know, there was no comfort in putting it over there. So I assume that's how I got pulled into this. <laughs> <coughs> but that's a good question. Thank you. The, it looks like the permitting process is, in the state waters is taking way longer than you anticipated because of all of this footwork you're doing with the public. Do you think... Um, I know Neil Sims used to always say, everyone's in a race to be first to be second when it comes to offshore aquaculture. No one wants to be that first person out there to get nailed. Do you think the next company is going to have a much easier time, quicker time to get a permit? Well, I, I think Steve hopes that that's the case, but <laughs> I, I, I could not answer that question. But Rick, you got to, I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of that one. Yeah, and feel, feel free to contact me. I can, okay. I can, I can help you with I, that. I will. I absolutely will. I have a question. Uh, so is the purpose of the demonstration to, at some point in the future, try to scale this up and what kind of capacity? I would say that's the hope, that it would, it would scale up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yes. I mean, do you see the space? It seems like you had trouble finding a, a place to place well, your we're, demonstration. Well, we're going through a lot of detail right now. Yeah. We're going through a lot of detail. I would say my concern is the price of the aquifer. And so Mike's going to, but Mike believes that he can bring that price down. You know, otherwise we're going to have to convince investors. Hmm to get involved with this. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, in my mind, kind of defeats the purpose of this because the goal is job force training, increasing employment. If you go to some of our fishing villages, they're in pretty rough shape. 
And then we've got a lot of kids who don't want to go to college. That's where the oyster aquaculture got off the ground yep. in Alabama. So, and, and, you know, and those kids are wicked smart when it comes to the ocean. And so we, we've got to make sure we get the economics right on this. And that will be out of my mm -hmm. area of expertise. But yeah. um, Steve Cyphers can probably come in at that point. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that was kind of my next question question was outreach to the the next generation of would-be commercial fishers right. and we will incorporate that in our k-12 program among mm -hmm. other things yeah you know and and i probably do 30 public presentations a year so and that includes our 22 presidents which are like herding cats <laughs> and you know We've talked at length with Auburn. I'm, I'm sitting down to talk to Chris Roberts again on the second. Um, we talked to their aquaculture people. You know, mm -hmm. you name it, we're we're yakking at them. Yeah. You know, so it's it's going on at multiple levels. But as you know from your time, education is kind of what we do. It is, yeah. Yeah, you're a great facility for that. Right, and you know, and another way I can connect is I'm still running that. Alabama Center for Excellence, which grew out of the Restore Act. Mm -hmm. And I can take advantage of those opportunities as well, mm -hmm. especially in the intern side of things. Yep. Well, I wish you luck. It sounds hey, interesting. I wish me luck too. too. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions? One from the audience. Sorry, I didn't know I was supposed to introduce myself last time. My name is Captain Kendra Arneson, and we operate in both state and federal commercial fisheries here out of Louisiana. Um, I'm, what I'm hearing, and I'm just trying to unpack everything that I'm listening to, is that um, there is, uh, seems to be, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not trying to characterize anyone in a negative light, but from my perspective as a fisher, it seems to me that there's... Um, this message that's going to be put out that we're not going to be negatively impacted in the commercial fishing sector or that we're not going to be slammed by this. But in fact, currently um, our shrimp fleet is in full collapse because of importation of aquaculturally grown shrimp. And this is something that we're struggling with big time. So when I think of um, aquaculture projects here in our own our home country, um, there's a huge concern from, from our community, sure. especially when you're talking about going into coastal community schools and educating our children to shift them from our way of life into this new form of food production. And, you know, I'll, I'd hate to be um, perceived as uneducated on this subject because I've done quite a bit of research as a commercial fisher into open water aquaculture, and we do have a lot of concerns, especially being in a storm environment with a floating unit like this, um, you mentioned June and July would be, you know, optimal for yield on this product, but what happens to that floating cage, cage during the downtime, and um, how do you see this benefiting the commercial fishing industry rather than impacting us in a negative way? I would assume these cages are going to have to be removed, you know, because they're going to have to have maintenance done on them in any event, but you're raising an issue that is a little bit different on the aquaculture piece. And the only reason I know something about it is one of my daughters works for Oceana, and she's the one who caught the Chinese with the Galapagos and all that stuff and, and the illegal fish trade. And there's been a couple of bills that are working their way through Congress to make the import industry identify the sources and locations for where the imports are coming from. You know, I don't know where Sway came from other than what Costco has on their bag, you know. But that's an education piece, too, is to grow native and consume native American fish. You know, there's a lot of education that has to go into this, but I can't imagine a situation where Steve or any of these gentlemen that are here would turn their back on our wild-caught fishermen. I just can't, I don't believe that that would happen. So some accommodation would come from this, you know. 
I can't imagine why anybody would want to put the wild fishermen out of business. Seems to be happening pretty quickly. Yeah, the economics are not great from what I can tell, but I'm not in that aspect of this. Well, this, the same group of um, corporations that are part of Stronger America through seafood have been buying up our land-based infrastructure and pricing us out. So we've been targeted in a big way, and um, it's killing my coastal communities. So, it, well, you know, that's why I came to this event this week was to learn as much as I can and um, to convey a message from our wild harvested fishermen that we do, you know, we'd like to continue our culture and our way of life, raising our families on the decks of our boats and continue and feed in our country. Sure. But the expansion of aquaculture into our own country is a huge concern, not necessarily as much for redfish, which is what your topic is with this specific project, but things like Almaco jack, amberjack, other species, because ultimately looking at the way business is done as usual, um, what we've experienced is to see where some of our local finfish farms that are on land dump right before we start to harvest within our season of the wild harvested product. So what it does essentially is bottoms out our price and then makes it where it's not manageable for us to um, harvest our wild caught uh, products. So that's, you know, it's a big rosy picture and and we're all, and, and look, I've been feeding my country my whole life. I've been doing this since before I was a teenager. So feeding my country is super important to me and the people that come from my community, but you know, at the same time, we want to find some kind of balance where people from my way of life, water people culturally raised on these coastlines still have a place in our coastal communities. And if we can't be part of our food production system any longer, then we can't stay home. So what I start out with, and I use this in our state's Republican caucus, it, just before the appropriation season kicked off. Every bit of this is a big part of America's historical and cultural heritage. And I can't imagine why any of those folks would want to be against this. Just, just look at the impacts of science on a lot of these, and the great snapper count that was just finished. Probably the best population survey that I've ever seen done. There's more snapper being caught now. You know, I, I would say get involved, you know, go down to LumCon and, and see Brian Roberts and start talking to him. And I guarantee you, Brian can get in behind this cause. Get your parish leadership involved and get them involved in this. I'd love to talk more with you about that. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective, too. Pardon? So that's going to be our, that's the, we, we don't have time for any more questions, but um, feel free to seek out the speakers during the lunch and, and chat with them on the side. I think we've had a great panel today, so thank you so much. Yeah.